Good morning. A warm welcome to you all for today's webinar. I'm Mr. Shekala Yalgi, Assistant Professor of Physics, Dawangere University, Dawangere. Now I request our Chairman, Dr. M. M. Katsat, to welcome the gathering. The ubiquitous gallium-nitrate nanostructures organized by Department of Physics, Dawangere University, Dawangere. I welcome today's resource person, Professor uh, S.M. Shiva Prasad, sir, Director, Karnataka State Higher Education Academy, Darwad, and Professor of Chemistry and Physics of Materials Unit, JNCSR, Bangalore. Um, for his interest, I welcome on behalf of Faculty of Physics, Downgere University, Downgere. I welcome our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, Professor S.V. Halse, sir, for this webinar. I welcome uh, Professor Gayatri Devaraj, a registrar, down here University, down here for this webinar. I also welcome uh, registrar evaluation, Professor Anita HS Madam, for this webinar. I welcome all the participants and faculty members of Down here University, down here. Once again, I welcome all of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I request our registrar. Uh, Professor Gayatri Devraja, Madam, to say a few words about the webinar. Yelri Maramskaya, good morning, everybody. Um, most respected, honorable, visionary Vice Chancellor, Professor S.V. Halse, sir, and Registrar Evaluation and Finance Officer of this university. Most importantly, today's resource person, uh, Professor uh, Shiv Prasad, sir, uh, from Uh, Director, Karnataka State Higher Education Academy, Darwad, and Professor of Chemistry and Physics of Materials Unit of JNCSR, Bangalore, and all other uh, delegate, uh, delegates here, uh, Professor uh, G.H. Malimut, sir, and uh, uh, Professor uh, Suresh Kapatkar, sir, and uh, many more professors across uh, uh, Karnataka are here on this platform, and uh, Department Chairman, Professor uh, uh, Prasad, Professor Ishwarappa, and all the faculty members of Department of Studies in uh, Chemistry. And dear students, research scholars, and each and everyone who are uh, um, present on this platform. Indeed, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to Dawangere University to have uh, one, one more uh, most important topic to uh, enlighten us. Uh, here we have uh, Professor S.M. Uh, Shiv Prasad. He's going to explain much about his uh, meritorious uh, uh, scholarly lecture on the ubiquitous gall gallium nitrate nanostructures uh, to our uh, uh, dearest students and research scholars and young faculties. And I request all of our faculty members to get enriched and uh, have a discussive interactive uh, uh, lectures program in this particular platform. And gallium nitrate is having wide applications starting from uh, LED to and many more uh, uh, applications across that is useful to humankind and uh, um, uh, society. So it is gaining each day, it is gaining uh, uh, tremendous applications with the uh, low cost technology and uh, in an amicable way, in a user friendly way. So um, a lot of information that will be delivered by the, an experienced scholarly person uh, like uh, Professor uh, Shiv Prasad, sir. And indeed, we are very delighted to hear you, sir. And uh, we are fortunate to have you on this platform. We heartily welcome to Downgere University on, online at the moment, sometimes later, when the COVID situation set right. you please come uh, offline and interact physically with all of us. And then um, uh, we seek your uh, um, uh, knowledge sharing to our students for enrichment, which is essential, which is the need of the day. I, I thank, uh, uh, or first of all, I congratulate uh, the organizers of, for this uh, arranging for this program. And uh, um, I wish maximum benefit will be reaped by our dear students. Thanks uh, for the opportunity provided. And I wish a grand success of this program. Thank you one and all for uh, giving me this opportunity. Jai Hind, Jai Karnat. Thank you, thank you madam. Thank you for your encouraging words. Now. It's time to listen to the resource person. Before I hand over the session, let me introduce Professor Shukrasat, sir. 
I'm indeed delighted to introduce eminent scientist, professor of physics, and a great academician, Professor S. M. Shubhrasad sir. Professor Shubhrasad sir is currently the director of Karnataka State Higher Education Academy at Dharwad, and also senior scientist and professor at JNCSR Bangalore. He has PhD in thin film physics from Karnataka University Dharwad, followed by postdoctoral research at IIT Delhi and University of Sussex UK, and a recipient of BSc from VSK University Ballari. Professor Shubhrasad was scientist at National Physical Laboratory New Delhi for two decades before he joined JNCSR. He has been a visiting scientist at National Institute of Standards and Technology, Maryland, USA, and at Rutgers University, New Jersey in USA, Tohoku University, Sendai in Japan, and University of Ulm in Germany. He is a recipient of many awards and medals. To mention a few, he is a recipient of Young Scientist Award from President of India. Raja Ramana Senior Scientist Award from Government of Karnataka, Superconductivity and Material Science Award, the Distinguished Lectureship Medal by the Material Science Material Research Society of India. He is also Honorary Fellow of the Karnataka Science and Technology Academy. His research interests are thin films, surfaces and intersurface interfaces of metals and semiconductors, and growth and properties of nanostructured wide band gap semiconductors. He has published 286 research articles in international journals and 23 articles in national journals and delivered about 500 invited talks. He has authored two books and edited one. As a director of higher education academy, he has promoted high quality education in higher education institutions of Karnataka. He has designed and implemented best practices through teacher training in pedagogy, research methodology, personality development, ICT, education research, etc. In the last three years, he has trained around 2,100 assistant professor, 300 principals, 300 librarians, 100 non-teaching staff, and around 200 students. Professor Shukrasat has been an Indian representative to many forums like the International Union for Vacuum Science Technology Applications, World Materials Research Institution Forum, Europe India Corporation for Nanotechnology, and Indo-Brazil Cooperation for Science. He is a he is the Vice President for Material Science Society of India. He is also a member of VGST of Government of Karnataka and the Advisory Board of BL for Night Division Device Development for DRDO, DMSRD, Kanpur, and Smart Material Research for Sirisol Research Foundation. With this brief introduction, I welcome Professor Shukrasat sir to today's webinar and I hand over the session to sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Shishkala, madam. Thank you. Kalsad sir, thank you, Gayatri madam, Gayatri, I mean, uh, to all of you. And also, I don't know if uh, Hals, uh, Professor Halse and Anita madam are there, but uh, uh, if they are there, uh, good morning to all of you. All of you. Uh, uh, university is an upcoming, very nice university. I look at the campus, it's very beautiful. And I'm sure uh, now all the people are busy building up and making it into a wonderful university. Uh, we will, I mean, uh, I will also, as uh, Gayatri madam, uh, uh, said that I'll also be very happy to come and participate uh, with the activities you have in the university. Okay, I, I'm, I'm also glad that our other friends outside the Davangir University will join. And this is a great thing about uh, technology, right? Your friends here, technology giving an opportunity across. I, I, I mean, some people, I've, I've entered your house, and some people have entered your college, I've, some people have entered so many, wherever you are. So that's the great thing about this technology, that the reach which, I, which you have is just amazing. Uh, I, I heard that uh, there are about 100 participants on the Zoom and uh, several on the uh, YouTube live also. There are several there and that. So uh, today you see the topic was very interesting and scary, right? The, the word ubiquitous. Okay, what is ubiquitous? Yeah, I'm sure a few, a few of you tried to look at the dictionary to see what ubiquitous was. Okay, if, if not, hopefully, I will not tell you the meaning today, but probably at the end of the talk, you will realize uh, why I use the word ubiquitous. Okay, that is very important. I'm sure you all heard. And I'm sort of uh, uh, keeping the level of the topic for uh, uh, for senior graduates or uh, or post graduates. So there'll be a little bit of introduction, and then I'll go to, into my research work, which is there in that. So, uh, but but however, if uh, some of you uh, you have any trouble understanding, or if you think that I'm talking nonsense, please raise your hand and tell me so. Okay, then I'll be able to change my gear a little bit. So so that we are in sync. See, I don't want anybody to be listening who. Who are not enjoying it or who are not participating in this so i request all of you to participate anything you want please raise your hand we will stop there and we'll have a discussion there is no need we don't have a syllabus to cover or anything so let's enjoy the enjoy the talk
Okay, so what I'll do, friends, is uh, I want to share my PPT, right? Uh, sh share my PPT, and we'll start with the PPT. Okay. So, uh, can you all see my PPT? Yeah, Vaman Kantada? Yes, sir. Okay, see, what you have in this picture is a very interesting material. You see here? There are some some spheres, some balls of different size. Then there are some walls like this, etc. You can see this very uh, very funny structure. Actually, the scale the scale is very important. Each ball, the average size of this ball here, you can see here, is about 80 nanometers. Okay, this is a scanning electron microscope picture of a very interesting material that we have made a few years ago. Uh, I've been working on this material for the last maybe five six years. It's a very interesting material. And hopefully at the end of the talk, you will, you will understand why this material is very interesting. So this, this material is basically, these walls are made out of gallium nitride. Gallium nitride is a semiconductor compound. Okay. And uh, Apurva, I want your video on. Shashikala, madam, your video on. Please Gallium. don't switch it off. <laughs> Please don't switch off. Okay. My request to you, all of you. Okay. Right. Nanostructures. <laughs> very good. Very good. <laughs> Who is that? First word, though. Let me see. Read the first word. Let me see. Try to read the first word. Yeah. Okay. Nanostructures. Very nice. Very nice to see a young, uh, young student getting so much interested in this, uh, in my topic. Okay. So this is a gallium nitride nano wall network. So the material is made out of gallium nitride and we have made some walls. I'll talk about this a little bit later. And what you have on top of this is small, tiny balls, different kinds of size balls. They're silver nanoparticles. So there are silver nanoparticles which are deposited on the gallium nitride nanowall. And hopefully as I go along, I'll show you how interesting this material is. Uh, because it, it is it has got, you know, gallium nitride, first thing we need to understand is a semiconductor. And the silver nanoparticles are metal nanoparticles. Okay, so what happens when semiconductors and nano nanoscience combines together? That's what I would like to share with you. Because that is the future. In the next 15, 20 years, I think most of the research will be combining nanostructures with with uh, uh, with semiconductors okay so we'll talk about that as we go along so before that okay let me see okay so let's talk about optoelectronic devices you know optoelectronics can be divided into two parts optics and electronics right so optics means something to do about light and electronics is something to do with uh, current right so optoelectronics is a field which combines light and current so what what conducts light is conducted by the photons and what conducts electricity or electronics is is by the electrons. So it's basically a photon electron interaction, right? Optoelectronics is a field which is photo, uh, which, which combines electrons and photons, right? So because optics and electronics, uh, photons and electrons. Okay. We'll talk about that. So what it means is somewhere you switch, you put the switch on means you give the current, the light should come out. Right? In any device, when you put on the current, the light should come out. And when you, or sometimes you put the light and then current should come out. Right? So these are called as optoelectronic devices where light and uh, electricity are combined together. Optoelectronics. Okay. Like the examples here, all the things you see, your uh, DVD player, your television now, LED televisions, your LEDs, normal lighting, your printers. I mean, all sorts of things, your uh, traffic lights. Okay, for your photodiodes, I mean, so many things are there which are related to this, uh, in the blue lasers, the laser beams, everything is done, are called as, they are optoelectronic devices. What, because what do you do in a normal LED, for example, in your mobile phone, there are so many LEDs in, in your mobile phone. What you do is when you switch the power on, okay, you get the light on. That means electricity is combining with the, with light, right? So, so there are different things, even solar photovoltaic, photovoltaic, voltaics is where you put the light and get current. And solid state lighting is LED when you put the current and get the light out. Then you have a lot of entertainment electronics, medical applications, displays and signboards. Everywhere you go on the streets, you will see these beautiful signboards, etc. But the most important communication about optoelectronic materials is communication. 
communication what is communication how i communicate with you right now i'm communicating with you okay on this uh, on this webinar i'm saying something which is my camera is looking at into me and then my ppt is being shared all this information is being transmitted through the internet right it it goes to the internet and somewhere it it goes to the through the internet to your house and it comes in your computer right so there you can see the light and the photons but what is being carried in between is something we'll try to understand okay so this is these are called optoelectronics this is this field is called optoelectronics and all these devices which uses optics and electronics are called as optoelectronic devices okay right so now as i said the information here is carried to your place in davangere or any other place wherever you are through something called as optical fibers right is a very important transition which was made so this transition was made by the use of optical fibers so what what are optical fibers they are the wires which can carry light right normally the wires which carry current are copper wires you know aluminum wires all sorts of metal wires are there but light cannot be carried through that so what what uh, what to do was you know light light we all know rectilinear propagation of light it goes in a straight line that's what we keep telling but how to bend it okay so the the person who who learned how to bend light is narendra singh kapani okay he was working in london okay in the in the in, in university college of london and he he is called as the father of fiber optics he found a way of making these wires in which light can travel okay this is amazing right you, you, you all know what is fiber optics i don't have to tell you it uses glass wires because we know that light travels to grass when light travels to grass he decided that i'll make wires of glass and make sure by using the concept of total liter reflection i want to make sure that the light remains inside the glass it doesn't come out of the glass by using that concept he made these fiber optics so everything we do in in, in the internet is carried through fiber optics if suppose you do talk something from here it goes to your tower by by wireless methods from the tower it is put into fiber optics then it is traveled in different places of course there are in between some boosters and other things but ultimately it goes goes through the fiber optics to different places you know that fiber optics cables are millions and millions of kilometers of fiber optics cables are laid under the ground okay to go from country to country because they carry the most of the information so like that the fiber optics is there and this but then which is the wavelength which is used is very important right which is the wavelength which communication uses in the fiber optics is this graph see this graph is shows i am sure you may not see it on the x axis is wavelength okay wavelength in micrometers and in the y axis it is attenuation means how the signal is is captured means it is absorbed by the material by glass and you can see here the lowest means where the lowest absorption happens is at something like 1553 nanometers okay please remember this 1553 nanometers or 1.5 microns so this graph tells me that the, the the light which travels the longest inside glass is 1553 nanometers so if i want my information to travel through the internet i need to create 1553 nanometers of information right so how do i do this is the is the challenge right so anything i do like all the picture you are seeing all the voice i'm talking everything all this audio visual information is connect is converted into 1553 nanometers and then it is transmitted in the fiber optics because that is the one which travels the longest you should understand this this y axis is a log scale so it looks very very small the change very small but actually because it's a log scale it's actually very big to condense that log scale into a smaller region we 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 plot it in log scale you know that so ultimately you see here in this graph 1553 nanometers is somewhere here so everything not only do that you can do multiplexing here as i have shown the curve here but i'll not talk about it today so 1553 nanometers is something i want you to remember that that is the wavelength in which light travels inside inside your uh, fiber optics okay so internet the one of the most important numbers in internet in the in optical communication or in the internet or in the fiber optics is 1553 nanometers so okay now let's see how it is done okay right so we go here now let's start with an led you know we all know led okay um it's led is a small device you know that you go to the shop you will tell him give me green led blue led red led so that is what a consumer will look like consumer will say it is something a small glass bulb with two legs hanging 
so that is an led for him and if you put electric connections to that it will give light and it will give different colors of light so that is how an led is seen by a com by a common man but then electrical engineer looks into this into this what is what is inside that and then he finds there is a important structure here then you start seeing many things here different layers some contacts wires then there is a uh, silicon lens and then there is a small blue thing you see here the tiny thing and that is the brain of the led that is the brain of the led so he tries to understand what is in the brain of led this is what an electrical engineer so electrical engineer doesn't know what is inside this but he just buys what is called as a chip he puts it together and once he puts it together he gets an led out of that and that's what the electrical engineer's job then an electronics engineer looks into that blue chip that small brain of the led it is zoomed here and you can see here this is something very interesting it has got n type semiconductor uh, p type semiconductor then there are contacts then there's an opening here for the light to come out and then the contacts are made here so the electrics and something happens and that is how electronics engineer sees but ultimately it is a material science engineer like me we want to see what are the materials which are used inside which creates that n pi n type of material which creates the bit of material which gives me electrons which gives me holes so this is how materials so a material science engineer electronics engineer electrical engineer and i mean uh, the the customer all together we come make this into a led so it's a very complex thing you all you should all know though it is such a simple led is such a simple you get it for 1 rupee in the market it is fully not made in india still the chips are Im imported from from outside i mean we'll we'll understand about that later why it is so complex as we go along you'll we'll understand what is the problem with the led okay now there are different kinds of leds these are these are called as light edge emitting emitting la lasers for example if you want to laser then you can create by this one or display emitting like all the leds we use which is not a laser when you want to show you want to make sign boards you want to do, do traffic light etc you want the angle of the light to come in many in, in a wide angle so you use this kind of display light emitting diodes which is given in this picture then you want very very sharp leds for example i told i need to create that photon of 1553 nanometers and i want to put it inside optic fiber i want to put it very sharp and that is done by what are called as vexels vertical cavity surface emitting lasers so this is but done by vexels so you get very sharp uh, uh, light which is carried without any dispersion in this in this point so this is what it is and see here you use a vexel here in this dabba and then you create that light which of wave whichever wavelength you want and then put it into this fiber optics you know fiber optics is a very thin wire of glass and you need to put not only one wavelength you can put many wavelengths inside that optical fiber which it carries right so this is how communication takes place now let us see what happens how do we produce this leds so what is the before that let us see what are materials okay we know different kinds of materials you know typically materials can be broken into different uh, category so we'll call here something which is transparent one which is transparent which is a called as a glass one which is sort of black okay which is which i call as a semiconductor and then you have metals right which is shiny metals which are there and if you also look at their conductivity you see that glass has very low conductivity very high resistivity okay and then this has some high resistivity the semiconductors and the metal have very very low resistivities right so this is what uh, this is what the conductors are but now when i look into the atomic structure of these materials it is something like this this is a cartoon not an exact representation but i just want to tell you a insulator has this picture the semiconductor has this picture and the metal has this picture watch for one second and tell me what is the difference in the three okay can somebody uh, unmute and tell me what do you, what is the difference you can see here in the three uh, in the three pictures in the three axes of orbital lines okay yeah very good uh, very very good you see here so somebody said excess of orbitals okay you can see some excess of orbitals and uh, yeah that is interesting so you see here so here all the electrons are filled and then there are some uh, some orbits which are not filled here yes one or two electrons are uh, unfilled and then here there are no unfilled electrons means all the orbits are filled right so this is the difference between the atomic arrangement of these three materials so what i'll call to make it simple simple i'll call this the electrons are in these orbits so all these orbits which are occupied we call we'll call them as a house of electrons 
house of electrons in our house also you know that you know everybody occupies a different room so like that different electrons also occupy different orbits so like that there is an arrangement of house of electrons they are all sitting in different rooms okay moving around or whatever moving around is a not a quantum mechanical concept but let us assume that there are all electrons which are moving around the uh, around the nucleus so in their own orbits in their own house in their own rooms inside them so this is the house for electrons right these these are the houses for electrons now these orbits the excess orbits which are not filled okay we'll call them as roads for electrons means electrons okay can stay in their house but they can travel in the roads right so that's what it is in an in independent atom but now i'll put atoms together so when i put atom together so you see here so this is lot of um, roads and here there are uh, some roads very close to the house but here there are no roads so now let me look, look at a solid state picture of this so now what i can do is i can call this material say for example insulator all the electrons inside the house are in this green box okay i call it as the house of electrons or it is also called as the valence band and then you have the roads for electron i'll put all these electrons inside this box and i will call it as roads for electrons and it's also called as the conduction band and the energy which is required for the electron to go from the house to the road the energy required for the electron to go from the house to the road i call it as a band gap eg okay energy required to go from house to the road and see here this band gap is very large in case of case of insulators okay it is very large it is of the order of 5 or 4 or 5 electron volts the insulator and that's why they are insulating okay i'll i'll talk about that because the road, they cannot go into the roads i they cannot conduct because electrons cannot reach the road and so they cannot conduct on the road and that's why their resistance is also very high their conductivity is very low but now if you go to the semiconductors the there is a gap means there is a energy which is required to go from the house to the road means from the valence band to the conduction band some energy is required less energy is required but you can go to the road see that is what a semiconductor is so now if you can uh, you can go to the road but you are actually sitting in the house so the so the semiconductor on its own is an insulator okay only when you do something to it it becomes a conductor but in, in case of an insulator it's always a bad conductor because electrons cannot go the energy required to go to the road is so much that nobody wants to go to the road they want to sleep in their own house itself the electrons want to sit in their own house they don't want to go to the road so that's what it is and then look at this this is conductors conductors means you, the house is in the road itself so what happens when the house is in the road itself okay some salman khan will come and hit, hit you in his vehicle and yesterday today's news uh, saudi sun also hit hit somebody on the road okay so this is what happens when the roads are in the and uh, in the houses are in the roads itself that happens in a conductor so you, you, you see you see here very interestingly electrons are bound here very strongly in case of insulator here they are bound but weakly bound they valence electrons and here the there are free electrons in a metal we call them as free electrons because they are already in the road so now let us see let's try to put light on this uh, sharan is this clear or should i repeat it yeah sharan yes, sir yes sir is it clear yes, sir. okay yes, so basically it is the energy required to go from the house to the road the energy required is very large in an insulator so nobody wants to go that's why it's insulating and in a semiconductor the energy required is small so when you give that energy it can go to the road and make it conducting so a semiconductor is an insulator on its own but once the electrons jump that gap then they become conducting and that's why it acts like an on off switch and that is why we can make a diode out of it a transistor out of it a integrated circuit out of it and all the things happen because of this beautiful phenomena of becoming of switching between insulator and a conductor in case of a semiconductor in case of a conductor because it's already in the road we say that these electrons are free electrons so you just put in voltage they will run around but they are not very free they can't come out of the material they have to be within the material because there is something called as work function which will not will talk little bit later which will hold the electrons together but they are free to move inside that material and that's why we call them as free electrons so now let's try to put light into it especially visible light so what is visible light we can typically call it as the web your light which our eyes can see which we can see we call it as web, 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 visible light so here i call this uh this is from here v i b g y o r i get all the colors here so we all know that the energy of the blue light is more okay so i'm putting it at the bottom so as we go up the energy is less similarly you see here 
this electron in this box are very strongly bound so i put them down and then if they are free electrons they come up into the road so i put them as low energy so i call this as low energy my energy is increasing in this direction okay so you should remember that's why the red which has got less energy is in the top and blue which has got high energy in the bottom in this picture but what is interesting you see here when i put light in terms of energy see now what we are seeing is not position it is we are seeing energy so you look at this energy of these of this light you know even the blue light which has got high energy is still smaller than the energy of the electrons which are bound in the insulator these energy are bound much more strongly so even when i put this light okay it will not affect the electrons at all they are strong they are more strongly bound so they cannot be hit right so they can, even if you hit they don't have enough energy to move them from there so they don't move there so what happens to the light is the light just goes through the material because it doesn't have enough energy to excite the electrons that's why it goes through the material that is why insulators are transparent right insulator of course you will ask me the question wood and plastic and everything which are not transparent but that's a different issue i'm talking about if we have a pure single crystalline insulator it is always transparent because the band gap is high because the band gap is so high that it is more than the energy of the light which we use of the visible light but suppose i use a wavelength which is more energy than the blue light so uh, can you tell me vaman which is the which is the wavelength which has more energy than the visible light yeah okay anybody can tell me which energy which which wavelength of light has more light more energy than the blue red light huh? yeah sorry somebody said something red red no red has low energy red has laser less energy not not laser I'm not, no no i'm talking about I'm color seeing, of light which yes, color light yeah violet yeah, color. yeah oh, more than violet yes. which one yeah in the in the this one see see red has low energy and a long wavelength and I, as i go from red to yellow to green to blue then the wavelength becomes small and the energy becomes more right and if i this is all which is visible to us the vibgyor colors but what are the colors which are not visible to us but higher energy it is called as ultraviolet light right violet and then ultraviolet when ultra means i cannot see it but the light is there so that ultraviolet light is if i use that then its energy will be somewhere here and if its energy is somewhere here then it can it can kick the electrons but this light the visible light we see cannot kick the electrons that is why glass is transparent if somebody asks you why is glass transparent this is the answer okay right now when i go and put this light on to the semiconductor i put the same light on semiconductor now see this energy now the my blue light has the same energy as the electrons inside their house so this energy can go and kick these electrons they can kick them and when they get that energy they have enough energy to be kicked up upwards so when we put this light something else happen that some light which is inside this gap will come through some light will be be absorbed by the material okay so you can see some absorption of the light of the energy and there is also some transmission of energy this happens in a semiconductor we'll see more about this little bit later now we have something called as a conductor so what happens when i shine light on a conductor what do you think it can can happen you know what happens when you shine light on a conductor okay it reflects the light okay why does it reflect the light because it is it has the energy it has energy of hitting all the electrons in their house but still why does it reflect the light because okay the energy is there they will go and hit the electrons but the electrons don't have a place to go they are already in the road where should they go okay so because they don't have a place to go with the energy they have okay what they do is they kick the light back and say i don't want you you go back and because of that they go back and that is why metals are shining they look like a mirror even in our mirror we have actually a silver layer inside that which gives us the the uh, reflection so all the light is reflected so so you see here all the light is transmitted here some light is transmitted some light is absorbed and here all the in the metal all the light is reflected but of course the electrons have hit the material hit the electrons i mean the the photons have hit the electrons and they get the energy and they vibrate okay they vibrate but they cannot go anywhere because there is no place to go 
this vibration of electrons is called as phonons. Uh, sorry, is, is uh, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, when it uh, the electrons are called the oscillation of these electrons are called as plasmons. Okay, the plasma electronic oscillation is called as plasmonic oscillation. We'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, so is it uh, is it clear, um, Hanumant uh, Badiyar sir, that uh, what happens to the light? Why? Why is a glass transparent? Why is a semiconductor? Why does semiconductor absorb light? And why is metal reflecting? Is it clear, uh, Tipesh or? Uh, 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 yeah, or, yes, sir. Or yes, sir. Yes, sir. want some clarity? Yes, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, right. So I, I request all others, Amritesh, Baubali, Amir, also to keep their videos on. So that uh, you know, I can talk to you. Otherwise, I it will get terribly boring, boring for me to talk alone, right? So, uh, so let, let's keep talking to you. Okay, uh, Ashwajit, thank you for uh, coming on the line. Okay, so it's very clear why the light goes through the insulator. These are all important small things which are very, very important to understand because our visible light has a smaller energy than the binding energy of the electrons and that's why the light goes through. But here, when the, when it is there, that light gets absorbed. But here. It gets it can it gets absorbed partially to only oscillate, which are called as uh, plasmons. But all the rest of the energy is reflected, and that's why we we see a reflection, and they are shining. The metals are shining. Okay, so with this basic thing, let's go ahead and now tell, and that is why you get this metallic lecture. Now let's look at a semiconductor in more detail. So this semiconductor, you see here, this is my house of electrons, where one electron, red electron, is sitting inside the house. And this is my road for electron. And I told you that the energy required between the road and the house is small. It is possible to get that energy, right? The visible light can also kick this. So now let us see how, if I kick this electron, if I give energy to this electron, what will happen to this electron? What will happen to this electron? It gets the energy. If it gets sufficient energy uh, equal to the band gap of this material, it can go from its house to the road. Right. So let's see. Let's kick it and see. How can I kick it? I can kick it by different ways. One, I can heat it. Okay. One, I can rub it. One, I can put light on it. Some form, I can kick it. So now let me kick this electron. When I kick this electron from the house, it gets the energy and goes to the road. Right. It goes to the road, which is the conduction band. So it, when it goes to the road, it starts thinking, what shall I do? Like all of us, we go to, we want to go to the college, we go to the road and then we go to the road and start thinking, is it important for me to go to the college or should I go back home and sleep, right? This electron also thinks like that. So this material is called as a direct band gap semiconductor. You can see the band, band gap energy here. This is a direct band gap material. That means you see here, the top of the house and the bottom of the college or the road are in the, are the lowest distance. If I want to go here, this distance is higher. So this is the lowest distance. These are called as direct band gap semiconductors. When the direct band gap semiconductor is there, the electron always which has gone to the road would want to come back to its house, right? It wants to come back. So now let us see what happens to that electron. It says, I don't want to go in the road. I want to come back and sleep in the house, in the hole. And that the hole was left here. A bed was there. An empty bed was there, which was telling him, please come, come back, come back. So that electron wanted to come back. And so it comes back and occupies the its bed. But it had got a lot of energy from that kick. It had collected energy. It went to the higher energy. Now, when it is to come back to its house, it has to lose the energy. And that is why that difference in energy, which is equal to the band gap of that material, of the energy of the material, is given out as photons. Right? You understand? That excess energy comes out as photons. Right, another electromagnetic radiation, which are called as photons, which is here. It is happens to be in the wavelength of light. We call that's why we call it as photons. So now let us see. This is what this is, happens in a direct band gap semiconductor like gallium nitride. Okay, this is not true with the indirect band gap semiconductor. So so you can see here very interestingly in this material. You can actually kick the electron, let us say with electricity, we can have a battery and connect it across this, and then the electron goes up then comes down and that energy difference, it gives out as a photon, it comes out as light. And this is how an LED works, right? 
LED works by this making this transition where the electron is excited to the conduction band and then there's a recombination of the electron hole recombination which gives out the excess energy energy difference as light okay so very interesting uh, just think about it i'll ask this question later so what is the energy of this light which comes out okay what is the energy of this light which comes out okay think okay. about it i'll ask you later okay I'll, I'll i'll ask you later just think about it okay now let's go to a different kind of semiconductor different kind of semiconductor which is a indirect band gap semiconductor like for example silicon or silicon carbide or anything of that sort see here see the top of the house and the bottom of the road are not in the same straight line the bottom is here so it goes it has to go along a different momentum space okay so when it has to go directly it doesn't have to it only have to change energy it doesn't have to change momentum but here it has to change momentum also so changing momentum is difficult right so this transition is very easy changing momentum is difficult but somebody else has to help you to change your momentum because momentum depends on your mass and your velocity right so this momentum change is done by the phonons of the material we will not talk about it later but but there is a phonon also involved in this process but you can see here so the material if i have this electron which is sitting here i can kick it up by another energy let's say a sunlight i can use sunlight to kick this electron in the house and this electron again goes to the conduction band goes to the road and then in a semiconductor so it has gone here it has gone here now by the force of the sunlight but it is difficult for it to come back like this unless it has photons because it is not direct right so it's a indirect material so that's why what this will do is when i put an voltage across this material it likes to stay and the conduction band itself it roams around in the road itself so i i'll i'll show this picture again this is very important see once the electron you see you put this light on this one this light from the sunlight kicks the electron the electron goes to the conduction band valence band to the conduction band means house to the road and the hole remains here bottom and then you have the electron staying there itself and staying in the road so it conducts so it becomes conductor conducting so you see here light is not coming out out here but what is coming out current is coming out of this one so this is the basis of of a solar cell so in a solar cell you still have the semiconductor but it's a different kind of semiconductor it's an indirect band gap semiconductor where the electron gets excited from the valence band to the conduction band and it stays in the conduction band it doesn't want to come out come down because its momentum has to change and that's why it stays in the conduction band so when i put an voltage in the conduction band it's a, it is free in the conduction band but it cannot come back to the valence band and that's why it travels and produces electricity right that is how a solar cell works silicon is a indirect band gap semiconductor which gives you this kind of a material very interesting right so the same semiconductor we just because there is a difference in the kind of semiconductor you can get either a light out of it or you can get current out of it right so interesting okay now you see here that question i asked you so the amount of light which is absorbed in case of a solar cell or even in case of led and the color of the light which comes out depends on the band gap of the material right because this energy which was here comes down here so the energy difference between here to here okay is the one is the light is the energy of this light which is coming out which is also the energy of the absorption because the light has to go from here to here absorption and then followed by this emission so you see here in this picture if the band gap is small the energy of the light which is coming out is low so i get a red light out of it and if it is slightly bigger than that then i have green light coming out of it because this energy is more than the red light and if the energy is very high okay then i get blue out blue light of it so these are called as narrow band gap semiconductors these are called as normal semiconductors and these are called as wide band gap semiconductors so you see what color led now you have different color led white led blue led yellow led green led everything is there so that will depend not white of course white has a different story i'll tell about that little bit later all the colors the bigger color leds can come depending on the band gap of the material so when you see a led you have a different material when you have see a green led you have a different material when you have a blue led you have a different so that which have different band gaps so the band gap determines what 
light is absorbed in a solar cell and what light is given out in an LED. Okay, this is very, very important to understand. The band gap plays a big role. Right. So now let us look at the, at the semiconductors. Right. So you, you, you see here, these are semiconductors. I'm taking a small uh, part of the uh, large periodic table, the group three, group four, and group five. You see here, the group four, you have, see, group three, left side are all metals and right side are non-metals. In between, you have this, these are called semiconductors. Metals and the, means what? Metals are the ones which give electrons, right? And non-metals are the ones which take electrons. In between are the ones which are confused, which don't know what to do. And that's why they become semiconductors. Materials which give out electrons are called metals. Materials which take elements which take electrons are called non-metals. And in between, they are called semiconductors. So you see here, we all know two famous semiconductors, silicon and germanium. Of course, carbon is not, not always a semiconductor. Tin is not always a semiconductor. Lead is also not a semiconductor. But they all behave like semiconductors in different conditions, which we'll talk a little bit later. But the naturally available semiconductors are both silicon and germanium. And I, I'm sure you, you know that. Sharon, what is the band gap of silicon? Yeah, approximately. You remember in your college or school, you studied band gap of silicon H2? Yeah. Then for the name. Okay. Do you remember? Okay. Uh, uh, one point one electron volt. Okay. One point one electron volt. And germanium is about 0. 0.7 electron volts. Right. These are the two semiconductors. But both are indirect band gap semiconductors. So now tell me, because they are both in, indirect, we cannot use them to make LEDs. We can use them to make solar cells. That's why we have silicon solar cells, but we cannot have LEDs. These semiconductors don't make LEDs. So we'll now talk more. These are the only two which are available. Okay. But ultimately, we know to enhance the quality of, of, uh, of these materials, I can dope silicon with something and get more electrons, or I can dope, I can dope this side. If I dope with this side, that means one electron less. So one electron will go here. So I'll create a hole. So I can go dope it with a group three material, this semiconductor, and make it as P-type. And or I can dope it with the N-type where it have one excess electron and that excess electron will be released as seen in this picture. So it and it becomes an N-type of semiconductor, right? So you can get two types by doping, doping their neighbors. One neighbor who wants electron and one neighbor who gives electron. So if you dope with the, somebody who wants electron, you become P-type. And one when you dope with a material which has got a uh, excess electron, then you call it as uh, N-type, right? So that's that is this typical semiconductors. Now see here now what i do i create a diode right you know led means light emitting diode right there is a diode means there are two things not only one thing so you have one side is a p type of semiconductor and the other is a n type of semiconductor and when you connect the battery across the two and that is what happens what we saw here the electron goes from the house to the road and the road to the house that happens in that semiconductor and we'll talk about the diode a little bit more later so this is how we know that diode characteristics, etc. We have all studied somewhere or the other. So now let's look at something. If nature has given me only two semiconductors, silicon and germanium, and they are indirect semiconductor, how will I make direct semiconductor out of them? This is the question. So that means I have to make some artificial semiconductors. So we have to make some compound semiconductors. I can make them by making compounds. Say, for example, see here, silicon and germanium. See, this side, there are three electrons in the outermost shell. This has four electrons. This has five electrons, six electrons, like that, right? Periodic table from left to right goes on. How many electrons are there in the outermost shell? One, two, three, four. And that determines the periodic table. And you know that at the end, eight electrons in the outermost shell, then the, at, and then the element gets saturated, and you cannot have more than eight, eight electrons in an outermost shell. Then again, the next shell starts filling one, two, three, four, and that's how the periodic table is formed. So now, interestingly, all these elements on this side, one, two, three, group one, two, three, I'm, I'm leaving the transition metals. We'll not talk about transition metals here. Just you look at this basic eight groups. If you see here, all these up to group three, okay, are giving out electrons, right? Are giving out electrons. And that's why they are called as metals. And here, four, it doesn't know what to do, whether to give four electrons or take four electrons. They are confused. And that's why they are, they are semiconducting. And these want electrons. This side want electrons. And that's why they are called as non-metals, right? So now how can I make more material semiconducting is to how to, that means how to have four electrons in the outermost. 
I have to make materials with four electrons in the outermost shell, which actually means I have to take a group three element and combine with a group five element. If I take a group three element and combine it a uh, group five element, it will be three plus five divided by two average is four. So I can take group two elements and then combine them with group five elements. And I, when I mix them, when I alloy them, I get four electrons in the outermost shell and it becomes semiconducting. Right. So what I can do, see how many semiconductors I can do. I can take get boron nitride, boron phosphide, boron arsenide, boron antimonide, boron bismuthide, aluminum nitride, aluminum phosphide, aluminum arsenide, aluminum antimonide, aluminum bismuthide, gallium nitride, gallium phosphide, gallium arsenide, gallium antonide, gallium bismuthide, indium nitride, indium phosphide, indium, like that you can get so many uh, semiconductors, right, by just mixing group 3 and group 5 elements. So I get a it's hundreds of elements I can do because I it, it, you know why it is hundred because I can also change the ratio of the element. For example, if I'm making gallium nitride, I can change gallium nitride ratio. I can make it 0 0.1, 0 0.9, 0 0.2, 0 0.8. Combine, I make it one. So I can change the ratio also. So I can get an infinite amount of semiconductors by changing the the element from the group three to group five and also changing their okay their composition composition so i can get 100 as many semiconductors as i want this i can do okay again uh, this i can also do by combining somebody's uh, somebody please mute your uh, this one little bit disturbing please mute your uh, okay thank you very much so now you can also do the same thing by combining group two and group five also uh, group six also group two and group six again two plus 6 is 8, divided by 2 is 4. So you can make semiconductors. So I can get zinc oxide, I can get zinc sulfide, zinc selenide, green, zinc telluride, green polonide, okay, and cadmium oxide, cadmium sulfide, cadmium selenide, cadmium telluride, cadmium polonide, and mercuric oxide, mercuric selenide, mercuric sulfide, mercuric selenide, telluride, like that. So I can get group, group 2, 6 also semiconductors. So I get 3, 5 semiconductors and group Two six seven, and these are very very important materials. Okay, these are very very important semiconductors because you know. And how do you characterize a semiconductor by its band gap? That is the main character. There are other characters also, but the main character I, you can characterize them is by the band gap. So obviously, when I make a different semiconductor, Hanumantore, uh, I get different band gaps. So I get different band gaps. That means I can get infinite number of band gaps by combining. Other, you agree, Hanumant? Okay, okay. You can get. Is it clear, Hanumant? Yeah. Unmute, Madhuri Hanumant, or yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Huh? Uh, so, so yes. see, uh, nature has given only two semiconductors, silicon and germanium. But see how many Hanuvant can do, how many semiconductors Hanuvant can do, right? Hundreds of by mixing different kinds of elements from 3, 5 or 2, 6. So these are called as 3, 5 semiconductors and they're also called 2, 6 semiconductors. Okay, now let's see this person, okay, Suji Nakamura, who got a Nobel Prize in 2014. Okay, he got a Nobel Prize for doing something very interesting. Okay. I'll share that with you. I also had an opportunity to work with Suji, Suji for some time in Japan. Okay, so he's a wonderful, his story is very interesting actually. You know, he was working in a small company called Michiya Corporation in Japan and he got this idea that, and he wanted to do a PhD. And just like now, no, we want a promotion. So he also, they also, the company said that we'll give a promotion only if you do a PhD. And the, in those days when he was doing a PhD, they said that if you publish five research papers, you will get a PhD. Okay, and that is what used to be the condition in Japan at that time. So he went on, uh, he, he went and asked people, what can I do, what can I do, how, how can I publish my papers, how can I get my PhD? Very interesting, he, he tells it in his Nobel lecture also. <laughs> okay, I mean, he admits, you know, his, uh, how he, he did his PhD. Okay, and then he says, somebody tells me, hey, look, if you make this gallium nitride and you can alloy it with uh, something else, with the group three and group five with gallium, you can get some very interesting materials, they told him. And he said, oh, I will do that. Then he could come, came and told the company that I want to do this. They said, no, 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 nothing doing. You can't do this. You have to do your job here in the company. You can't do this. So because somebody told him that is the way to make blue light. Because earlier, blue LED, if you remember, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was no blue LED. Blue LED is a new concept. Only about 15 years ago, it has been found out. Earlier, we had red LEDs, green LEDs, okay, yellow LEDs, amber colored LEDs, but we did not have blue LEDs. And we also did not have white LEDs. 
until the blue leds came the white leds were not possible right so because you wanted the all wavelength from vib gear the blue was not there so how can i make white white comes by mixing all the colors so i could not make it so he wanted to do this material but the company did not allow him but ultimately what he did but he had all the material in his company in that small company called nichiya corporation in japan then he in the night he used to after his office work after his regular uh, laboratory work he started doing this work for his phd right and he found out this amazing amazing uh, material called gallium nitride he made this gallium nitride and showed that its band gap was 3.4 electron volts and when he did this he said that now i can make a blue led and he told his company nichia corporation that look i made this beautiful led they said no 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 you have wasted our time and our money it is not necessary for us we did, you didn't do the right thing but ultimately we know because there were a lot of defects at that time in this material etc when he made it was not a very good material but at least concept wise he showed that you can make a pure gallium nitride material and once they realized its importance then it became the discovery it was possible to make blue leds that is one of the greatest uh, one of the greatest things in optoelectronics was to make blue leds so nichia i mean of course three people got the nobel prize with uh, with nakamura uh, amono and uh, suzuki but uh, most I mean, this particular work was actually done by nakamura so you see here what he did was very interesting this graph tells you this is the structure of gallium nitride i don't want to go into the details okay of this structure it's a wurzite structure you know what is a wurzite structure it is very simple it is a hexagonal structure where two elements are there any hexagonal structure with two elements is called as a wurzite structure and this is the wurzite structure which has got gallium and nitrogen as two elements so now you look at this very interesting band diagram so you see what is plotting along the y axis is the band gap of that material and what you are plotting along the x axis is the lattice constant lattice constant means the distance between atoms arranged in that material the distance between the two atoms which are arranged in the material is called as lattice constant okay so now you see you forget about the lattice constant at this point of time but just see here this is gallium nitride okay it is a band gap of 3.4 electron see 3.4 electrons means it is more than the visible light you see here it is more it is it comes in the ultraviolet light which i told you in the beginning it comes in the ultraviolet light but so it was not giving blue light so how to make blue light then he started thinking i can go on adding indium to it because indium nitride has a band gap of 0.7 electron volts 0.6 0.7 electron volts now there is a lot of debate we have also made this material a very interesting indium nitride material and we have shown that it is even less than 0.6 uh, ev band band gap material and that work is being very interesting now people are trying to follow that work so anyway forget it it's about 0.6 uh, electron volt band gap indium nitride so what you can do here to go from gallium nitride to indium nitride 3.4 to 0.7 electron volt you just have to go on removing one gallium atom put one indium atom remove another gallium atom put another indium so you can go on changing the composition of gallium nitride by allowing it indium you see here i have this material inx ga1 minus x n means little bit of x amount of indium and gallium now is reduced by that x amount and then you mix it with nitrogen you get a material called ingan it is also popularly known as ingan material so you go on changing the composition you see the band gap changes from gallium nitride to indium nitride you see it goes along this curve you can go along this curve to change from 3.4 electron volts to about 0.7 electron volts can go that means you can get any band gap you want in between by just changing the composition so if i want a green band gap i can go up to here and i can stop the amount of indium if i want to go to blue i can go up to here and stop the amount of indium if i want yellow i can go and stop it here if i want to red i can go and stop it here if i want in the infrared i can stop it here if i want in the ultraviolet i can put a very little indium if i more the indium i put and replace and ultimately when i replace all the gallium of indium with indium it becomes indium nitride right it gets a band gap of 0.7 or 0.6 electron volts so that is what this is called as band gap engineering and this discovery by nakamura was amazing now not only that if another brother okay like with gallium nitride indium nitride there is another brother 35 which is called as aluminum nitride aluminum nitride has a band gap of 6 electron volts so now i can go this is gallium nitride is already in the ultraviolet but if i want deep ultraviolet if i want to go to higher energies 
ultraviolet means very high energy very powerful right you know that uh, that's why uh, you know ozone hole because ultraviolet light can come and destroy our cells okay high energy is very dangerous but you can make like this is used to you allium nitride is a 6 ev band gap material it's a very high semi insulator okay uh, glass is has a band gap of 5 electron volts okay and aluminum nitride has more than 6 6.2 electron volts so it is a very large insulator but if i go on mixing gallium with aluminum i mean removing replacing aluminum with gallium i can change the band gap from 6.6 electron volts to 3.4 electron volts so i can actually control the band gap of a material by alloying here also so alloying is one way of changing the band gap of a material and choosing different material combination was another way which we talked about right so this is ultimately this all these process of changing the band gap i'll show you more as we go along when we go to nanomaterials there are different ways of alloying or changing the band gap of a material and these all techniques are called as band gap engineering how can we engineer the band gap how do we control the band gap okay now let's go ahead and see and see here this graph is amazing right i mean actually you can see it is not i showed only gallium nitride here so here there is a aluminum gallium nitride indium nitride here there is uh, beryllium sulfide magnesium sulfide like that you can go on alloying and getting different band gap at different wavelengths with different lattice constant etc lattice constant becomes very important i'll tell you later right now let us assume that only the band gap becomes important so you can see all materials all the 3 5 see these are the 3 5 compounds and these are the 2 6 compounds so you can actually change this and get a huge range of semiconductors with different band gaps and different lattice constants okay this is beautiful so it's almost infinite you can think of it you you choose the band gap material you can actually make it and with enormous accuracy and that i think is the most important thing in the future of optoelectronics the way it is being done okay now let's go ahead now you see here now i told you we talked about leds so there is a region suppose i take one led okay any led it is may one semiconductor let us say a silicon or a gallium nitride or let us take gallium nitride because today i want to talk about gallium nitride i take gallium nitride material and then what i do is i make one side very rich with electrons and one side very rich with holes that means one is a p type and one is a n type and i told you earlier how we make this rich is by mixing it with the neighboring at a neighboring element so i can actually dope it with the neighboring element and make it n type and p type right so i can make this and now what i do is i put this battery why do i put this battery and connect uh, electricity because i want to kick those electrons from the house to the road i want to kick those electrons so once i kick the electrons obviously the electrons are more in the uh, n region and they will go and occupy the holes in the p region so there is a recombination of electron hole recombination and now because it is a diode the probability is very large right the probability of recombination is very large that's why we use L L diodes in only a semiconductor will not work the amount of light coming will be too less so to enhance this probability of recombination i make it into a pn junction and that's why it is called as a light emitting diode so now you see here so what happens inside this diode you see here from one side the holes are coming and i put an voltage which is called as a forward bias right Ele holes come from one side and the electrons come from one side okay one side okay and when they come very proximal to each other okay they recombine the electrons are attracted by the holes this is like in a college student a boy comes from one side a girl comes from one side they meet here in the in the in davangere university and they decide to get married so they get married here and when they get married they have to produce something what is the produce they produce a child here right so similarly here the electron holes recombine to produce light right so like we talked earlier they can uh, this happens in a semiconductor that is how so the case of a L, this is how led is produced light is produced so this is led is the case of a marriage right then the electrons combine combine and the electron and holes combine they get married married so now you see look at this material now this is that indirect band gap semiconductor now the light strikes and the current flows in this material that means reverse of this the electron and holes were sitting together i separate them with excitation and i pull them out in different opposite directions so then i get the light uh, light and so i, I oops, sorry and so this is a case of divorce the solar cell is a case of divorce and the led is a case of marriage right so so it's easy to remember 
the electrons and holes if they recombine you get leds and if they separate out then you get solar cells so what you can see very interestingly is both are useful divorce is also useful marriage is also useful sometimes only thing is the marriage gives you light and the divorce gives you current okay <laughs> electric shock so that's what it is this this picture shows you that now let's look at this so i to as i told you from the beginning we have a material let us say we are talking about leds for example now so i have a direct band gap semiconductor material and then i have this material so my electron gets excited into the conduction band and then comes back to the valence band okay and because it is not straight okay and it it likes to come here it cannot go anywhere else so it prefers to come here because it is in the same momentum space so you get the electron back so you produce light but as i told you in the material one electron will be excited and it doesn't know where to go to search for the electron so to enhance the probability of one electron which is excited to come and recombine we create a diode that's what i told you but even this is not very efficient we have to enhance the efficiency of of an led by making a this very interesting heterostructure okay so this heterostructure is terribly semiconductor heterostructure is very very important see what is in this structure you see here see this is one band gap of a high band gap material this is a region of another high band gap material so you can see here this is one band gap one i mean one high band gap material one and high band gap material and in between i have put a small band gap material okay so this is for example i have taken here aluminum gallium arsenide on the outside which has got a larger band gap and i have taken gallium arsenide in the middle which has got a small band gap it can be gallium arsenide it can be gallium nitride it can be anything but just an example of a heterostructure so what is interesting when i make this picture and when i make this kind of a structure very interestingly something called as band bending happens okay band bending happens and you see here because of the band bending you get this kind of a notch you see this notch okay alfaro got the nobel prize for making this notch okay very important with this semiconductor heter heterostructures by this one so what happens in this structure very interestingly you see this i can excite the electrons make them go up this wall and fall into this well so the all electrons get accumulated inside the well so the density of electrons inside this well becomes very large right so i can make the electrons come here and fall into this well and that's why and and this and this notch here does not allow the electrons to go out again so they are stuck now with the, both the notches on both sides of this well they are stuck in this well and they are stuck in this well so the probability of them combining with the hole in the bottom becomes very high the so my efficiency of the led increases but interestingly the size of this well also matters that's why this is called as a quantum well because it has got a size of the dimensions of the wavelength of these electrons that's why we call it quantum well why i'll tell you that brings us what we study in the particle in a box right you know if you remember particle in a box if this is a box if i have a well with infinite potential on both sides then when i put the electron inside this box if it was a ball it would have sat in the bottom kelagbant it would have sat in the bottom of the box right it would have sat there but the electron is not a ball not a particle it is a wave and because it is a wave it has to have a wavelength so that means it has to have a wavelength which starts from one end of the box and ends at the other end of the box so you can see here the wavelength can be this large at the size of a well or it can be like this when it becomes two okay which are which are called as integral multiples 1 2 3 parts right so you get 0 1 2 um, integral multiples so the wavelength has to start at the end and the wavelength in between it cannot stop here at the wall that is why you can't have any other wavelengths in between you get only discrete wavelengths in this material okay this is the particle in a box so obviously more the energy of the box the smaller the wavelength then it goes higher in the box the energy becomes high this more smaller energy will come down and it has got a smaller wavelength right so this is the particle in a box which we all study in quantum mechanics so now what happens if the particle of the box has a finite potential this is an infinite potential that means it can never come out of the box it is stuck inside the box but here also it is got a finite potential but still electron cannot come into the box but the probability of it coming outside the box increases this is very interesting very very interesting non intuitive part of some of, uh, of quantum mechanics so it means the ball is also inside the box and it's also outside the box 
very difficult to understand right because we don't see it as a ball now it is an energy it this is called as evanescence okay a light evanescence outside a discrete particle box so that's what this this uh, band gap engineering i mean and this material is all about we'll come to that in in a little bit while you know when you bring such boxes of of uh, finite potential together you you bring them together very close to each other then see one electron can be in this box also and that box also right because the wavelength can overlap and their wave their wave functions can overlap that's why we call this as a concept as quantum mechanical tunneling right we call this as tunneling and this is possible only when when the box size is very very small see now very interesting you see by making the size of the box smaller and smaller in this case for example you can shift the band right you can shift the position of these electrons you can make it go up and down depending by changing so this is another way of controlling the band gap of a material you see if i can shift this energy level in this one go up and down okay i can also change this band gap in this material and that i think is very very interesting right so you can see that you can actually control the band gap also by changing the size of the of the quantum band okay right is this uh, shashikala madam is it clear okay what what is happening or anything i should repeat here okay right so you can see here what is interesting is by making this quantum well i am not only enhancing the probability of recombination means from the road to the house the recombination of the road to the house but i am also able to control the energy band levels and the band gap of the material by changing the size of this box based on the on the particle in the box quantum mechanics which we have the schrodinger equation solution which we have all done in somewhere in puc or i don't know bsc somewhere we have done this right so that's what it is so that is again utilized here to control the band gap of a material so now let's go ahead now the question is okay question is if this is true how do i make a white led okay how do i make a white led i told you to get one led you need a one band gap of the material so how do i make a white led is the best way to do is okay by how do i get white color by mixing all colors right i take all the your colors and mix them together and i can get a white led right so now similarly so if i want to get a white led i have to mix all the colors that means i have to mix all the materials with different band gaps and all of them mixed together will give me the white led right similarly in a solar cell see the solar spectrum again uh, I'll, i'll show you the solar spectrum is like this on the picture which is shown here this is the solar spectrum this solar spectrum shows me that it is not one band gap i need many band gap to absorb all the light right if i have only one band gap only one wavelength will be absorbed or something below that will be absorbed that is the problem with silicon solar cells silicon solar cells have a band gap of 1.1 electron volts that means somewhere here 1.1 electron volts so that means only some light is occupied by the solar cell only that light is absorbed rest of the solar energy is being wasted in a silicon solar cell that's why our silicon solar cells are now the best in the world are only about 15 16% solar cells efficient solar cells they are much not not more than that in fact the company with the commercial ones we use is less than that is even less than 10% efficient solar cells the efficiency of solar cells if i want to enhance the efficiency of the solar cell i have to absorb all the wavelength which comes from the solar cell right from the sun all the wavelength that means i need different people to absorb different so what i can do to make a efficient solar cell i can make a sandwich of different semiconductors okay i can take a this material which absorbs red light this which absorbs green light this which absorbs blue light like that i can put all the colors i want i can prepare the semiconductor and that will absorb all the wavelengths from the solar cell then i can get a 100% efficient solar cell you understand so what you are doing is now shashikala madam has one ability ishwarappa sir has another ability ashwadeep has another ability i have another ability all of us start working together so we have all these four abilities that we can absorb all the light which kalsad sir can give right so this is possible by working together such kind of structures you can see here is called as the multiple band gap tandem heterostructures 
multiple band gaps because there are materials with different band gaps and they are heterostructures because they are structures with different materials you are combining them and they are tandem they should work in tandem because the wavelength which is released by the red light should not be absorbed by the green now green should not be absorbed by the white so they have to be in tandem so we call this as multiple band gap tandem heterostructures and now see even in leds also same thing if i want to get white light what i can do is this can give the rgb colors the red this part gives the green this part gives the blue this part gives when you mix red green and blue you get white color and that is how you can get a white led right so you can see very interesting way of, uh, of using semiconductors and their band gaps but you look at your mobile phone uh, later and when the when the mobile uh, when the flash is off you look at the when the light is off you look at the led from the back on your light mobile phone you will see a yellow color on that i think some of you might have noticed yellow color on that because it is actually right now we are not able to make this kind of tandem structures i'll tell you later it is because of the lattice mismatch between them we are not able to make these kind of a tandem structures though we can we are do able to do something in solar cells but we are not able to do in led this kind of tandem structures and because of that what we are doing right now is very simple we are making a blue led okay and putting some yellow phosphors on top so the light from blue led goes through the yellow phosphors it absorbs and gives out yellow, a white light okay blue and yellow mixed together will give you white light so that is the process how our leds right now the white leds which are which we use all the white leds you use either in your in your flash or your mobile phone or in your torch or anywhere you see the white leds uses this mechanism still we are not able to make this multiple band gap heterostructures properly okay so it is very important but in solar cells there is lot of progress and people have got by making these kind of a tandem structures they are able to get about 57% efficient solar cells Okay, right now it is very very expensive but still people are able to use multiple band gap structures and make 57% efficient solar cells so this is how you can make very efficient leds and solar cells right so now i'll go to something else now i just want to now let's talk about my led a little bit more seriously which is true with, with applies to solar cells also but let me focus on leds so now if i want efficient solar cell a okay, 100% efficient solar cell one was to mix many thing but how do i make the material itself is very efficient what i can do is how do i do that is means when i make an efficient so what it means is i have to excite this electron from here to here and that electron has to efficiently come back here then only i get my efficient led so my semiconductor should be such a way that all the electrons i kick from here should go here and from there they should not be lost anywhere they should come back and occupy the same hole right that is very important to make a efficient so, uh, led led right so that means <clears throat> when you leave the house from here and go to your road in between there should be no distraction for you that means if there is a you know pav bhaji shop or a canteen or a theater or something we'll run away we'll not go here and similarly when you are coming back also if there are some things in between we will get distracted we will not come down so the efficiency reduces so similarly we should not have any electron states in between if there are no electron states in between the valence band and the conduction band we get an efficient led right so these electron states come in between because of defects okay if there are defects in that material we get some electron states in between and they reduce the efficiency of our led and solar cell you understand so i need to have a defect free material this is one way to enhance the efficiency you have to make defect free perfectly single crystalline we'll talk about in defects a little bit later so what i have to do is i have to enhance the excitation efficiency that means taking the electron from the house to the road and then i have to enhance the recombination efficiency that means i have to efficiently bring the electron in the road to the house and then i have to eliminate defect states i don't should not have any defects in the material then i can get very good what is called as internal quantum efficiency means it is inherent to the semiconductor i call this as an internal quantum efficiency right so that is what you can see here so i don't want to have any defect states in between now there is another problem okay i am in a in a material like gallium nitride for example gallium nitride i produce this blue light 
But the problem is gallium nitride has a very large refractive index. You know, when the material has a very large refractive index, what happens? The light gets trapped inside that material only. Right? It gets reflected inside only. Total internal reflection takes place and the light remains inside. It doesn't come out of the LED. Okay, it will be like diamond, for example. You know, diamond, we cut it in certain angles so that the reflection is in such a way that the light remains inside the diamond itself. That's why light diamond looks very shiny. If the light comes out of the diamond, then it will look like glass. But if I can treat it there because of its refractive index and the way we shape the diamond, the shape we cut, okay, makes it so bright and brilliant, right? Similarly, gallium nitride is a very large refractive index. So it acts like a diamond and keeps the light in itself. And if it keeps the light in itself, it's useless. I cannot get a good LED. So I don't want the total internal reflection to happen. Right? If I don't want the total internal reflection to happen, then I can get the light out of the LED. Right? And that's what I want. So what I have to do is I have to do the geometry in such a way that the light doesn't get total internal reflected, but it comes out because it's a geometric problem. So now there is a materials problem that I should have a material without defects. And I should say geometric problem that my geometry is in such a way that it should light should easily come out. First light should be created and then it should easily come out. If we make these two things, this is called as a light extraction efficiency. So we have two efficiencies for an LED. One is the internal quantum, uh, quantum efficiency and the other is the light extraction efficiency. The internal quantum efficiency depends on the defects and strain in the material and interfaces. And the light extraction efficiency depends on the refractive index of the material, which determines the total internal reflection. Okay, friends, is it clear, uh, Ashwajit sir? So, to me, how do I make my? So, let me talk to Ashwajit sir for a while. So, how do I make my material more efficient? Just because of the defect-free as well as the light extractions. Very good. It means by geometry. One is a materials problem, and the other is a geometric problem. Yes. Okay, if this is very clear, it will give an idea of the kind of research we are doing in the future. Okay, right. So now let's look at it. So now let us see, I want to make a defect free gallium nitride. Right, I do want to make it. Problem is, because I have to make very thin layers of it, I cannot make a bulk material out of that. And also it is almost impossible to make a very bulk gallium nitride, which is single crystalline in nature. So what we do is we put thin films of gallium nitride, okay, on some substrate. Right? If I want to make a thin film, I have to grow it on some substrate, on some surface. And that surface is called as a substrate. On some surface, I need to grow. But there is no surface which has the same lattice parameter as gallium nitride. You understand the lattice parameter mismatch. We call this as a lattice parameter mismatch is there. So because there is mismatch between the two lattice parameters, see, it's something like here. I have this size between the atoms and the substrate. Now I'm to trying to fit something with this size. It cannot fit properly. Only if both of the lattice parameters match, it can do it. I'll, I'll show you that a little bit later here. Okay. So what happens is because of this lattice parameter mismatch, what you do is that material grows with a lot of defects in the material. That means atoms are not sitting exactly. They go here and there, here and there. They create what are called as dislocations in the material. The first point, they form point defects. Okay. Different kinds of defects. And then they form dislocations. Means these are defects which travel over a long distance. So these are called as dislocations, and these dislocations are two types. If the <clears throat> if the defects okay are shifted like this, it is called as an edge dislocation. Because of that, if the atoms are arranged like this, means there is a shift in the in the Burgess vector, what we call as a Burgess vector. It just shifts in this direction. I call it as a edge dislocation. And if it shifts in this direction, angularly, if it changes angularly, I call it as a screw dislocation. So, unfortunately, this happens in the, the best substrate to be used to grow gallium nitride is sapphire. Sapphire is aluminum oxide. Chetana, can you put your video on, please? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Chetana, and Okay. If you can put your video on, that will be very nice. Okay. Anyway, don't worry about it. So, you can actually get two kinds of dislocations where the planes are shifted like this, which is called as edge dislocation. And the planes, when they are shifted like this, it is called a screw dislocation. So these dislocations, when they form at the interface where the material is formed, they can actually grow inside the material also. And that's why these are called as threading dislocations. What do I mean by threading dislocations is that 
oops, sorry, let me go here, threading dislocations, see here, that means the dislocations forms here at the bottom, but it travels through the material. It, the defect doesn't remain only here. It travels through the material. Once it is dislocated, it continues to become dislocated from the top to the bottom. So this is called a threading dislocations. So like that, we get threading dislocations such as edge and screw dislocations. Obviously, these dislocations, as I told you earlier, defects form defect states in between the valence band and the conduction band. So that means there are possibility that the electrons can get trapped in these states, right? The electrons can be stay in the states, and that is why you can you, you will get an inefficient material, right? You will get the electrons from the valence band will not easily go to the conduction band, and those from the conduction band will not come easily to the valence band because in between there are the distractions, there are these pani puri shops, there are these canteens, there are these restaurants, there are these movie theaters, there are some some other attractions which are there in between. So these defect states does not allow a proper excitation and recombination probability that reduces. So you can see here, which is put in this graph that if the dislocation density increases, okay, the efficiency of the material also decreases. So obviously, right, because all the light will be trapped in these defect states and the efficiency of the LED or the solar cell will become very weak. And that's why you can see from this picture, more the dislocation, smaller is the efficiency, right? So in fact, gallium nitride, gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide is very, very picky. It does not, it even if you have a little bit more defects, okay, it will not work. But gallium nitride is very, very forgiving. Okay, even if you have a defects of 10 to the see gallium arsenide more than 10 to the power of six defects per centimeter square you can it doesn't work but in gallium nitride even if you have 10 to the power of 10 defects I mean 10,000 defects per centimeter square more also still they work very well so that's the one I and mean, that also is a very interesting physics why it, why it does it but I today I'll know we'll not talk about that but just tell you more the defects less the efficiency right it's obvious okay friends now let's go ahead so now another concept, we are now understand how a semiconductor works, how etc, how heterostructure works, etc. Some, some basic concepts of that. Now we'll look at something called as the nanoscience, some basic concepts about nanoscience. This is very important. Everybody is talking about nano. So what is this nano for a physicist? What is it for a chemist? What is it for a biologist? What is it for a car buyer, the nano, Tata nano car, right? Which has nothing nano in that. Okay, but the name is nano, that's all. But ultimately, we want to find out what is this exciting field as, called as nano science. Okay, very briefly, I'll tell you something I like very much. So now, let me let me look at this uh, this picture. So here, see here, see now I have here very very tiny picture, but but bear with me. You will see the bigger picture. Here you have one atom. You have one atom. There's a nucleus here and two electrons revolving around that atom. One one example we take here. So you see here, as I told you, there are two electrons in their house. Okay, there is one, one orbit in where two electrons are there and one orbit where they can travel. Means this is the house of electrons and this is for road for electrons, as we told earlier. These are empty. So we call this as an empty density of states, unoccupied density of states, and these are occupied density of states. So if there are electrons occupied, there are also places for them unoccupied where they can travel. So if I excite this electron from here, it can go and stay in this orbit. Okay, you, you, you remember Balmer series and all those atomic spectra which we which we learned some time ago. This is basically, these are the different orbital levels which are there, which allow these kind of a, different kinds of transitions. Which take place. Now what I do, I put two electrons. See, when I put two electrons, now I have two roads two houses and two roads. Because there's been something very interesting about electrons. You know, electrons are defined by four quantum numbers. Okay, now I can define Kalsad sir by, by four different characteristics. One, he has a beautiful mustache. He has a second, he has a very nice smile. Okay, and he's a very pleasant man. Like that, I can characterize him by four different characteristics. But all electrons look same, right? All electrons are same. How do I distinguish them? So they are distinguished depend on where they are where the electrons are. So that's why in, in their orbits, they are defined in their orbits by their four quantum numbers, their four characteristics. The four quantum numbers define. And what is something very interesting about electrons is that they are a lot of pride in them. They say two electrons with, with all four quantum numbers cannot stay together. 
this is my Pauli's exclusion principle or also called as the Aufbau principle. And these are principles which tell us that all the four quantum numbers cannot be the same. That's why I put in one road or in one house, I put only two electrons. One which has upspin and the other is downspin. The rest of the quantum numbers are same, but one which has a different spin. So two electrons with different spins can stay together. So when I create two holes for two roads for them, houses for them, I also have to create two roads for them. Okay, so you understand this is what happens. So now I put more atoms, more atoms, more atoms. You see, my house is becoming bigger. Okay, and my roads are also becoming bigger. Once we have the population increases, you start seeing that the house has to become big and the roads also have to become big, right? So you can see here, like the Downingere roads, as the crowd increases and increases, the roads have to become bigger and bigger. And the house also, and when the population in the house also increases and uh, children also get married, you need to create rooms also for them, extra rooms for them. So similarly, here also the number of houses and the means we call them as electron states. States are places where electrons can occupy. Either they occupy, or they are occupied or they are non-occupied. The blue ones are the unoccupied electron states and the red ones I'm showing here are the occupied electron states. So you can see here, very interestingly, as I go on putting up the numbers, this stage goes on, in, the road increases, the, the, uh, the house increases, etc. But they saturate after a certain time. And do you know where it saturates? It saturates when it attains the Avogadro's number. When it reaches the Avogadro's number, it saturates. It cannot change. The density cannot be more than that. So the density stops there. And that's why you can see the saturation. So earlier, we studied this region, okay, this part, we used to study as atomic physics. This we study as atomic physics. And this one, when it's saturated, when it has a fixed band gap, we call that as solid state physics or condensed matter physics, right? What was ignored in between is this, where depending on the size, the band gap was changing. You see here, the band gap here is fixed. Even if you change the size after this, it band gap will be same. But when I go here to lower values, you can see that the band gap can change, right? This region is called as the nano region. So nano science is something which was neglected. We did atomic and molecular physics. We did solid state physics and condensed matter physics, but we ignored what is called as nano science in between. So, but what is interesting here is that you see here, so this is a material called cadmium selenide. It's another semiconductor. I told you it's a 2,6 compound, which is called as cadmium selenide. You see, if I take nanoparticles 8 nanometers, it is this part of the region. Okay. That means this is about 8 nanometers. Then I have large, it has got more than the Avogadro's number. So now the color of this material, when I shine it with some light, is red color. Okay. Red color. That is its bulk color. Bulk color is red. But when I make it smaller and smaller, it band gap increases, right? And we saw earlier that when the when the band gap increases, the color also changes from red to blue. So you see here also that material you will change from red to yellow to green to blue so beautifully by just changing the size of the materials. Isn't it wonderful? This makes the nano science very very exciting. There are like this many properties which change, but here I'll surely talk about color because that is something which is related with our LEDs and solar cells. So let us focus only on color here with this nanomaterials and you can see it. And this is the one. Anybody who is doing nanoscience will always first experiment to do is this only. Take cadmium selenide, make it of different sizes and see the floor color fluorescence of that and you will see if you can make this red yellow green blue then you are you know that the method you are doing your nanoscience is correct okay this is what is the is the material now another interesting thing now i change the material so nanoscience means is about changing dimensions of a material that means i'm putting electrons and confining them in a small region i don't give it enough bulk material to roam around but i confine them in a smaller region when i confine them in a, in a smaller region the electrons behave in a, in a in a different way okay so now you see if i confine them in 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 three dimensions means it's free to move in all three directions okay it means it's not confined at all then when i plot the density of states versus energy means how the electrons are distributed the energy of the electrons is a parabolic behavior like it is based on the half mb square phenomena 
right? Half mv square gives you a parabola. So it's something related, not exactly that, but related to that. So all you can have all kinetic energies which are possible. So and half mv v square shows you there is a parabola. So it gives you a parabolic behavior. Now that is what in the three dimensional behavior. Now what I do is I make it, I make it into a into a sheet like this. I make it into a sheet that now my electrons cannot move in this direction. They are restricted to move in this direction. And this is just the size of the quantum well I talked about earlier. So if I can make the size smaller than that one, then the electrons cannot go up and down. They can only travel in this sheet, in the xy plane, in this sheet, in the xy plane. So now that means some states which are up down x states are not allowed. So instead of this parabola, some states not being allowed, I see this kind of a quantum staircase. Because these states, it should have gone, the curve should have gone like this. But these states are not allowed because of this restriction. So I start getting these kind of states. Now what I do, this is called as a quantum well, as I told you earlier. Now what I do is I can reduce the size in the other direction. So now I make a material which is only one dimensional. Means electrons cannot go up or down, okay, up or down. And they can also cannot go like this. They can go only along this tube along this rod okay we call this as a quantum rod right so it goes along this rod so because it's only one dimensional path is allowed so now you see here again more paths are not allowed here the high energy paths are not allowed so this shift and becomes like this you see it becomes like that it becomes like this it becomes like this because these high energy states are not allowed so that's why you'll get this kind of density of states Right now, what I do, I again further confine it in all the three dimensions and put it in one small box, and doesn't allow allow it to go in any outside. Now it is purely a particle in a box. When I put the particle in a box, now I have states almost like in a solid. That means I get discrete states. Uh, I can get the behavior, the density of states like this. Okay, so you understand by just changing the size and the shape of a material, I can change the house and roads of the electron. The density of states is nothing but if the occupied density of states is called as the house of electron, unoccupied states are called as the roads for the electrons. So I am changing the shape of the house and the road by changing the dimensions of these materials. Right? Very exciting that I can change the house and the roads of how the electron of the electrons, and so I can change their behavior because of size and shape. And that is why nanoscience is very, very exciting. This is the most important thing about the nanoscience that by changing the shape and size of nanomaterials, we can actually change the properties. Once we change the road and the house, all properties can change. Whether it's optical properties, it's electronic properties, there's magnetic properties, there are all properties. Everything can change because we have changed the electrons, the valence electrons. We have changed the house and roads for the electrons. Right. So that is why you can see this very beautiful thing. Right. So this is what is very important about nanoscience. So friends, OK, uh, you understood. So you can see here. So the most important thing about nanomaterials is when I change the dimensions of the material, when I change the different dimensions of the material, I can change the house and roads of the materials. That means I can change the density of states. Okay. That's the most important sentence. This is one important. So the most important parameter of a nanomaterial is electron confinement. This is called as electron confinement. And this is what physics are physicists are excited about. Physicists talk about only electron confinement. For physicists, electron confinement is the most important thing for in nanomaterials, right? Not the other things, but the electron confinement is the most important. The variation of the band gap, the change of the density of states, the variation of the house and roads for the electrons is the most important thing. And then there is another interesting thing, which chemists like it. Chemists love this. You take this material. You say, suppose you take a sugar sugar cube. Okay, uh, you have to take take a sugar cube, approximately one centimeter in, uh, uh, in one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter. So, Ashwini sir, what is the surface area of that sugar cube? One centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter. Yeah. Pardon, sir. What is the surface? Sir, yeah. What is the surface area of a one centimeter sugar cube? So it is uh, almost one centimeter. Almost. One side. One surface is one centimeter square. But how many sides it has got? One cube. Six. Uh, six. six sides. So, so total surface area is six centimeters. Six 
That means if I take a sugar cube, its surface area is approximately the size of my hand. Of my yes. hand, six centimeters square is approximately the size of my hand. But if I make this material, if I take the sugar cube and make it into smaller and smaller cubes, I cut it into smaller and smaller cubes. I mean, I measure the surface area of each cube. This is a homework to all of you. So if I make all the cubes one nanometer cubes, instead of one centimeter cubes, I make one nanometer cube. And the same material which was there in one centimeter cube, which is the Avogadro's number, right, or uh, related to the Avogadro's number, what happens to the surface area? See, you as the size becomes smaller, the surface area becomes very, very large. In fact, something is a sugar cube which is my size in my hand, okay, when I make it into one nanometer particles, the surface area will be equal, will be become as big as a cricket ground. Okay, it will become like a cricket ground. Such a, such a large area. That means I one centimeter square, I can put it in a test tube, right? I can put the sugar in a test tube, break it into tiny nanoparticles and still put a test tube. But the area there is one cricket ground. Inside a test tube, I can create a cricket ground. So Hanuman sir, I can play cricket inside a test tube. And that is the beauty of the surface area. And this is the one which excites chemists. They love the enhancement of surface area because of so many reasons. Again, we'll talk about that. So you, know, you see, when the particle becomes small, surface area is very large. You see the amount of light absorption can increase, the light of emission can increase, and so many beautiful things can happen because of the size. So the size, electron confinement is one about electron confinement. The second is increase of volume ratio. The other one, even more interesting, is defect defects in these nanomaterials. See, you see, look at this material. These materials are beautifully arranged. The atoms are beautifully arranged inside these materials, hexagonal arrangement of these materials. But when I come to the surface atoms, see, these are all bound on all sides. They are friends on all sides. But you look at the surface atoms, they are not bound on one side, right? They are only pulled downwards, but nobody to pull them up. up. But look at this atom. He is pulled by everybody, all the six atoms around it. So this has got freedom to move. Okay, so they move and they don't sit in their positions. They are little bit disordered. So the surface atoms are disordered and we call this as surface reconstruction. This is called a surface reconstruction because the atoms are reconstructed. Now you see, earlier we used to ignore because the bulk material, there are so many atoms, okay, about 10 to the power of 23 atoms. And on the surface, there are only about 10 to the power of 14 atoms, 15 atoms. That means 10 to the power of 8 atoms difference between surface and inside the material. So we ignored it. Means about 10 crore times less effect. On the surface, atoms are 10, 10 crore times less than the bulk atoms. So we, we ignored that material. But once you put that material, you made it into a nanomaterial, okay, and make it very, very small, the, all the surface atoms becomes, all the atoms become surface atoms. That means all of them are not equally bound. So they reorganize. They sit here and there. So even if you don't have an external defect, just the de rearrangement can cre create defects in these materials. They can create defects in these materials. And that is what is beautiful about nanoscience. Now the question is how fast you arrange, how slow you arrange determines how much defects you can have in these nanomaterials. So now you have another handle. Earlier handle was size. The other was shape. And now we have arrangement of atoms. If you arrange the atoms differently also, you can get different, different band gaps and different states, electron states. So now, my friends, so these are the most important things about nanomaterials. Three most important things about nanomaterials is, one is the electron confinement. <clears throat> the second is the surface to volume ratio. And the third is defect engineering. Okay, These are the most important things about nano. And these are the only important things. So if you want to do research in nanomaterials, you have to look at these three ways of controlling them, of building them and making materials useful and finding new properties by these, by controlling these three parameters, three important parameters. Of course. Now, if you know all this, why everything in this world has not become nano now, right? I should have had a nano pen, nano computer, nano table, nano chair, nano everything, because you can make anything you like. Nanomaterial possibility is infinite. That's why I said next 10, 15 years, nano science is going to become the biggest science in the whole world, right? Every, because you can make every material a nanomaterial with any property you like. <clears throat> Suppose you, you want a material with 10 different properties. All of that doesn't exist with one person. Like Hanmanta uh, said, are you married? 
Hanumant Ore, Hanumant Bidigal, are you married? Illa, okay. Now Hanumant is looking, is looking for a wife, right? He is always thinking about a wife, which kind of a wife I should marry. So he's thinking, I need a very tall wife, I need a very beautiful wife, I, her nose should be like that, her mouth should be like that, she should be earning a lot of money, she should be very friendly, she should be humorous, she should not get angry. He wants some 10 properties inside that to his wife. Anuman sir is looking for 10 properties in his wife. You agree, Anuman sir? How many properties do you want in your wife? Okay. Eh? How many properties? 10 properties. Obviously, you will not get all the 10 properties in one wife. Right? So, you have to either marry 10 wives, which is difficult to manage. So, you don't want to marry 10 wives, but you want one wife with all these properties. But Hanuman sir, this is possible in nanoscience. By changing the shape and the size of a, of a nanomaterial, you can get any property you want, all the 10 properties you want. So that's why the infinite applications for nanoscience. You can really think of anything. Imagination is the limit. You start thinking, it should be like that. I need a material which is like that, like that, like that, and like that. Okay, you can get it. You can tell it can be insulator and it should be conducting. Uh, insulating and conducting, how it is possible, but you can get it in a nanomaterial. And that, I think, is the beauty of nanoscience. And that is the power of nanoscience. And that is why it is going to revolutionize what is going to happen in the future. So now, if, if this is true, why, nano, if we know all this, then why everything has not become nano? Is a question, right? We'll ask, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask this question, if this is true, okay, if, if this is what we are saying is true, why everything is not nano, right? Because the problem is that, we all in the last 25, 30 years, 25 years, we have learned how to make nanomaterials. But we don't know yet how to assemble them. Because see, I make a nanomaterial with a certain property. But now I have to ultimately make a bulk material. I have to make a pen out of it or a watch out of it or a book out of it. So that means I have to take these nanomaterials and again put them together to make a bulk material. And when I put them together, again, they will lose their nano properties. Right? And that is the reason why we have not yet revolutionized. Still, we don't have a large industry related to nano because the assembly problems. So this is, we know the properties and the abilities or the potential of nanomaterials, but how do they, how do we put them together so that they still retain their nano properties, right, is the challenge. So I think the assembly is a serious problem. So in this picture, you see, these are all beautifully aligned nano rods so beautifully aligned nano rods that they all each of them are aligned to make a bulk material but they are they still retain their nano properties because they are not combined together mixed when you mix them then they will ultimately become again bulk which you don't want to do that and that is the challenge and that is the future of research in this particular field how do we assemble them to get the properties we want okay fine friends now i think it's I, i've taken my two hours unfortunately this was all the trailer and my actual talk, talk starts now. So, <laughs> okay, Kalsad sir is worried. Okay, that I may take another two hours, uh, you know, of, the, of this talk. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> no, no. So, so, now what I wanted to do is, I just wanted to use these two phenomena. One, we learned what is semiconductors and how do you do band gap engineering. And then we learned how, what are nanomaterials and what are the different properties of nanomaterials, right? How we can change the properties of nanomaterials. So in semiconductors, we learned that what we need is a, in a semiconductor, there's a house of electrons, there are roads for electrons. Electrons have to be excited from the road to the house, I mean, uh, from the house to the road. And sometimes they come back. When they come back, they make a LED. When they, they stay in that and give current, it becomes a solar cell, right? And to how to increase the efficiency of the solar cell, we have to make the material defect free. Okay, but it's very difficult to make the defect free because there are so many interface problems, defects, etc. But still, we are trying to make defect free materials. And the second thing is, we also have to reduce the refractive index of that material by geometry. We cannot reduce the refractive index, it's a material property. But what we can do is we can change the geometry in such a way that the light, there is no total internal reflection and the light comes out, right? These are the things. And in nanomaterials, we saw three important properties of a nanomaterial one is electron confinement. If we confine them in different dimensions, mentions the electron states vary okay their house and uh, the roads for the electrons vary and second thing is we learned that the when the materials become very small the surface to volume ratio becomes very large okay this gives a very large surface area and the third we realize that we can actually create defects in these materials and control the defects in these materials by not only by putting external defects but also by rearranging the atoms by both thermodynamics and stat and, and uh, kinetics Okay, so if we can do all these things, we can do anything we want.
So my actually my work, which, which I've done for the last maybe now seven, eight years now, the work which we have done for about seven, eight years, which I wanted to show you is towards this. What do I want to show in my work later is, I mean, the work is that to show how do we in interestingly use these properties, okay, the, both the nano properties as well as the semiconducting properties, combine them and get very, very new novel properties, which we never imagined could happen. Okay, that is what we have done in our gallium nitride study. Again, we, we started with this, with the intention of trying to see how to enhance the the the, uh, the efficiency of LED. See, so what we wanted to do is we want to grow materials like this, which have got defects, which will not be efficient, but I have to grow materials which are flat without defects. And then we also have to grow, if I make a flat film, still the light will not come out because of the refractive index problem. So I have to make the shape like this. If I make them wedge shape, then they, they'll be total into reflection. You ca it cannot reach the critical angle, right? So then the light will come out of the material. So the idea is to make defect-free gallium nitride and to make them of this shape. If I could do that, okay, at the nano dimensions, that is the challenge, at the nano, nano dimensions, then I'll be able to make different LEDs. This is what we thought. But once we started doing, it was a gold mine. We've started seeing anything you change started giving us different properties so in this work of ours which is about again which i'll, I'll require a lot of time which i'll not take today maybe some other time calls it, sir we can have part two of this talk of people who are interested in this of taking this forward okay where we can actually will show you okay i'll just jump through my slides to this is a little bit more serious research right but i will not tell you about my research depth okay i'll just tell you what all we can do with this material i'll show you so this is the material we made we look at it, we, we see when I when you do this kind of material, you see this, this is the LED light which was giving. Now all the commercial LED, this kind of light. But actually now we see this much amount of increase just because of that shape and the material. You see this huge, we have seen about 400, 500 times increase in the amount of light which is there by this, by making this material. Then we look at the transmission electron microscope, see the atomic arrangement. To see these dislocations, which I talked about, we can actually understand the dislocations of these materials. Then we have done some simulations to find out about the refractive index. I mean, the, the effect of refractive index by different shape. You can see here by different shape how light gets scattered. These are called. This is called as a finite difference time domain uh, calculations. We did some calculations to see. And so, when you have a flat film, you get you can get this kind of light because of refraction. But when you have something like this, you can see here, you can get a different kind and an enhanced amount of light which is coming out of these materials. So we do this kind of calculation. Again, I'll I'll not tell you all the details, but I'll we'll talk about some other time. Somebody is interested, we can have a second round of uh, presentation. And then, so you see here, I can get enhancement of light. This is something we see. Then we put the silver nanoparticles because I told you earlier, the metal particles, the electrons oscillate inside them, which are, which are called as plasmons. And the way they control the plasmon, which resonates inside them, is called as plasmonics. It's another very exciting field. And so if we can put the silver nanoparticle on these materials, on this gallium nitride nanowall network, we could see a further enhancement of another 200 times of the emission from that material because of the coupling between the silver nanoparticle plasmonics and the material emission, which is there in the material, which again, I don't want to go into the detail. I'll just jump through it. So if somebody is interested, we can have another group and discuss all these things in another, another presentation. Okay, so this is what we did. And we saw by changing the size of these particles, we could change the light emission, which I talked about in the electron confinement problem. So using electron confinement, we could see all these kind of uh, um, changes. And then we have a model for that. We have developed a model to say how this light is emitted. And then we, we then we wanted to look at the work, how to make lasers out of this. Then we made these lasers. You can see a laser-like emission, which is coming out of these materials. And these emissions, then we looked at the, the uh, incidence depth, what happens in these materials, and found out how the lasing action depends on en en electron beam energy. So, uh, so you are changing the light from uh, from a uh, from a single wavelength to a double wavelength, which is uh, okay. Which again, uh, and then we we have again modeled that to find out how it actually happens, etc. We did some calculations, a lot of numerical solutions to these problems to understand how these kind of uh, interactions take place. Then you see when we go to low temperature on this, we start getting very sharp emission, a laser-like emission. And what happens at low temperatures is something again we try to understand by doing uh, those calculations. By it is based on the Purcell effect. 
um, the thresholds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we use this material to actually excite electrons by putting silver nanoparticles on them. So you can. This is called a surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. By using Raman spectroscopy, we can do it. So we put silver particles and found. And again, F did FTDD calculations to show that you can actually enhance the light with this one. And you can see here, you can actually get a fingerprint of molecules with F with. Uh, Raman spectrum. This is fantastic. You see here, organic molecules, you put on the material, you can actually find out their characteristics. So this is a beautiful method to detect diseases at very low stages, okay, to detect, for example, even coronavirus or even detect uh, AIDS virus. You can do this beautiful fingerprinting on these materials and we could get a very large enhancement factor of 10 to the power of 8 and, then, uh, and a concentration of minus 9. Then very interestingly, see this is a band material with a band gap of 3.4 electron volts, right? We saw we saw that it's very large. That means it should be an insulator. But we see that when this material in a certain state, okay, it also gives very large mobility, electron mobility. So it also becomes a very nice conductor. So again, dimensions. So insulate, it's also insulator in some in, for some properties, and it's a conductor for some properties. The same material behaving like a insulator, semiconductor, and a conductor. Very interesting, right? Same material behaving like, uh, you can never think of a conductor behaving like an insulator or an insulator behaving like a conductor. But here in this material, it also behaves like an insulator, semiconductor and a metal. Okay, very interesting. Then we did some FETs out of that. I mean, all sorts of things. Again, I'll jump into this, did some calculations to understand. Now we also see superconductivity on these materials. This is the work I collaborated with IIT Bombay and we have done some super low temperature measurements and we can also see superconductivity in these materials. Just again, all because of the dimensions right very interesting the shape and size of the materials then we look at and this is this is a very very insulator 3.4 that means there are no free electrons and if there are no free electrons there should be no ferromagnetism right but still we see ferromagnetism in this material and we have evidence to show that ferromagnetism by mfm studies by squid studies all sorts of studies we try to do look at the change the phase and see that the magnetism exists on these materials when you reverse the direction the domains magnetic domains change etc these are something and then you also do a, a, a lateral growth how to make a defective material you know there are a lot of uh, uh, lithography techniques which are used to make uh, pure gallium nitride materials because gallium nitride is very important to make LEDs and solar cells. But now we found that by making these uh, these kind of things, I mean, this was how <coughs> lithography is used to make pure materials uh, instead of avoiding defects. But we saw that by growing these materials, we can actually grow defect free materials on this surface. These are some again SEM and TM pictures which show you there are only stacking faults, but there are no threading dislocations of these materials. You can avoid the threading dislocations. Uh, how to do that is something. And then these we also are able to grow very high quality indium nitride nanowalls. As I told you in the beginning, we have seen band gaps of less than 0.6 electron volts, which is which nobody has seen. And though the theoretical limit was about 0.58, we have reached the theoretical limit of the band gap of these materials by growing this as on the template. So these are some mobility and some band gap and other calculations which we have done on this material. And here, so another last experiment we are trying to do of late is uh, how to split water. Water splitting is a, the artificial photosynthesis. You know, the leaves, what they do is they take the water, split the water H2 into H2 and O and get the energy. And then they prepare their carbohydrates and release carbon dioxide. This is what they do. Can we do such an artificial photosynthesis inside our laboratory by splitting water? Take two molecules of water and produce four molecule, two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen. So these are some things we can split water in these directions, which is possible. And then we did some experiment to find out using gallium nitride, choosing the right band gap, we can actually split water by doing electrochemical processes. So electrochemistry using this as one of the electrodes of our material, we are able to split that. So, okay, friends, I'll just show you one more picture later, but ultimately you see band gap engineering and the semiconductor properties combined gives you an infinite possibility of doing experiments and properties but the, doing the experiments are challenging but ultimately the idea is how do we combine all this to make devices which are stable and to lead new phenomena and but our aim as uh, physicists is to only find out new properties and show and the phenomena so that we can we can excite or we can get interested the engineers who can make applications out of this so with this uh, 
i thank you all for your uh, kind uh, saving and some if you are all interested i request kalsit sir to uh, collect all the interested people and we can talk a little bit more serious science in this which uh, which maybe some of uh, only interested people can join this this group uh, here so now let me uh, let me now stop sharing and i'll show you one more video of that water splitting experiment okay i'll just uh, share one more picture of the water share we did that experiment and actually we can release hydrogen out of it and we have gotten very high amount of hydrogen you can actually see hydrogen being released from water in one of this experiment let me show um, show how to do that let me find a air screen and then yeah you can see this is an electrochemical experiment we have done and you can see here actually hydrogen coming out of this you can see the hydrogen amount of hydrogen a very efficient way the photosynthesis is a very inefficient way of getting hydrogen photosynthesis works the less than 1% efficiency but these are 6 to 7% efficiency much much better than the green uh, green so you can see a lot of hydrogen uh, uh, which coming uh, this is another recent experiment recent data we have got from this experiment i uh, thank you all for your enormous patience and thank you very much uh, and if somebody is interested we can we can take these uh, kind of uh, studies forward thank you So I thank, thank you. you all. I thank you. I thank uh, Kalsit sir for giving me this opportunity to share some of the interesting physics and hopefully excite students to tell how beautiful this uh, uh, the field of semiconductors and nano nano science is all about, and that is about the future. So it's important for us to all excite the students to work in this field and come out with some amazing things because that is the future. Next ten fifteen years, I keep telling there are three important technologies which become very important for the next ten fifteen years. please understand every teacher every student should know three amazing technologies and everybody should understand this one is nano nano science and nano technology the other is uh, is um, uh, is uh, artificial intelligence and the third is biotechnology nano technology biotechnology and artificial uh, artificial intelligence are the three fields which are going to dominate this world in the next 10 15 years so the more the students more the teachers we get into this field the more successful will be will be in the future thank you thank you again uh, uh, for your patience yeah. thank you sir uh, shall we take a yeah yeah please i'll be happy uh, to sir, take uh, any questions if there are yeah now the session is open for question and answer yeah, yeah. participants can unmute themselves and uh, ask for yes. assistance yes namaste sir uh, ah yeah sagar tell me the rest of you mute sagar wants to ask a question yeah sagar Okay. Uh, is it possible to produce the gravitational field uh, in laboratory? S sorry, to produce a gravitational field in laboratory. La gravitational field inside the laboratory. Yes. What, what do you mean? Like anything? Yeah. Any two materials? Like you take, no. Any two materials you take, okay, are producing gravitational uh, field, right? So why do you think it is not possible to produce gravitational field? <laughs> Okay, so, when two when two materials uh, are brought together, there there is a gravity between them. So yeah, they are they are already so gravitational. So, yeah. Uh, we can arrange them uh, with the temperature uh, uh, using the temperature properties. We can yeah. arrange them the, in the uh, like the nano materials as I said. Yeah. We can arrange them in a specific order using gravitational field and the temperature. Now. Oh yeah 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 okay <laughs> very good okay so that's what you meant yeah actually yeah. in fact. Uh, Uh, in fact see uh, that is about growth of nanomaterials see people go, go do take and grow these in uh, in space okay space laboratories do these experiments of growing because you, you see in, in on earth it's very difficult to grow spheres proper spheres because of the gravitational effect we were mentioning so that's why we have to keep rotating things if you want to make a sphere but once you go into space where there is no gravity the uh, earth's gravity is very less you can grow materials but here what you are telling is it's very interesting what you tell sagar i, I mean i'm not thought about it but very interesting see if you see what you can do is you can bring gravitational waves okay uh, in in different directions create an interference between the gravitational waves and then you can get regions of interference where you can nucleate nano materials that can be a big possibility now people are doing this by using different kinds of waves not gravitational waves but because gravitational waves are too weak to do any experiment but uh, but in you know, a theoretically yes it is possible but experimentally it make may become very very difficult and not only that the gravitational waves are may not be coherent so in the sense that you may not get a proper interference and diffraction pattern out of them 
right? So that may be the reason when when may be difficult if that is what you meant. But see, there is another interesting thing. You know, when you make particles very small, okay, which are called as colloidal particles in nanomaterials, they become colloidal particles. They are so small that the, their internuclear forces or inter interaction forces are much stronger than the gravitational force, and that is why they don't settle down. Like for example, milk is a good example. The fat molecules are colloidal size; they are very very tiny size. The fat inside the milk is fighting between each other so much that they, they, it doesn't allow one fellow to fall down, right? That's why milk is always white. But you put salt or some, I mean, something else into the, inside the material and stir it. After some time, everything will settle down because the particle sizes are bigger and they are affected by the gravitation, right? But in case of milk or any colloidal nanoparticles, uh, particles of that size, then their inter intermolecular forces or interparticle forces become so large that they don't come and settle down. So that is also another effect of uh, of making nanomaterials using nanomaterials in terms of gravity in that sense. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank very you. good. Very. I mean, uh, it has given me some other thought. Let me. I'll think about it. Okay. Thank you, Sagar, for the nice question. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody so else? Yeah. Hello, sir. Ah. Yeah. Ah. Hello, sir. Ah, sir. Sir, what, are, what is the difference between a quantum dot and nano particle? Yeah. Okay, very, very good question. They are the same thing, right? See, Richard Feynman, the, yes. the father of quantum, quantum mechanics, I mean, the father of nanoscience, for example, he was the one who told he's, he's making tiny particles is possible and not only possible, you can understand. So the language of, of, quant, of nanomaterials is quantum mechanics. So quantum mm -hmm. mechanics defines everything which happens in nanoscience. So you cannot understand nanoscience if you don't understand quantum mechanics. So quantum nanoscience is nothing but an application of quantum mechanics, right? Oh, so now oh. when you say a quantum dot, okay, yes. it means that it is a particle in a box, okay, which is a nanomaterial, which I call it as a quantum dot, is a particle which is confined in all directions. Oh, okay. In, and the wavelength, the, the size of the box in which you put this electron is the same on all directions and it is smaller and it's of the order of the wavelength of that electron. And that is why a quantum dot is the same as a in nanoparticle when you make it into a quantum dot, you call it as a quantum dot. A nanoparticle okay. which is very tiny enough in all directions, then you call it as a quantum dot. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's sir, a, that's I have another question. Yeah, please, please. Uh, sir, uh, which method you are uh, used to synthesize gallium nitrate? Yeah, yeah, okay. We use one of the most expensive methods, the world's best method, yeah. which is called as molecular beam epitaxy. Okay. okay. So many molecular beam epitaxy. We we actually it is a physical vapor deposition method. It is like a thin film growth method, but with uh -huh. a very sophisticated thin film growth. Because you know, when we do a normal growth, there are so many other factors which influence the growth. Okay. So in a molecular Sorry. beam epitaxy, we can actually control every parameter of growth very precisely. And that's why molecular beam epitaxy is the best way of studying these materials. Yeah. Uh, you are growth on substrates, sir. Yeah, we grow on sapphire and silicon and other substrates, different substrates. Uh, which, uh, whether you use RFD sputtering or uh, some laser deposition? No, 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 no. We use molecular beam epitaxy. You see, molecular oh, okay. beam epitaxy is something where you have a crucible, okay, so yeah. that inside the crucible, the, the material is heated by electric field, by, a, by a electric field, and the material evaporates, and then there is a yeah. tiny hole. And the, the hole is so tiny that the beams come with the Newton's flow. You have heard of Newton's flow, okay? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, means with the means that the wavelength of uh, of the material which comes in one direction is focused than the other ones. So that's why we make a tiny hole. So we call that as a molecular flow or a Newton's flow, and that's why we call it as a molecular beam epitaxy. Yeah. Okay. So, so is it? Mm, yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Is it possible in the RFP sputtering? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Pe many people have made RF sputtering, people have done even thermal evaporation, so many things. But what you need to do is how to be clever, how do we control the size of the particles is the challenge. Even, you know, you can do it in chemical synthesis, right? Even yes, in laboratory, yes. you can do by a chemical reaction. But the question is, how do I control the size? How do oh, I make yes, all sir. the materials of the same size? And that is the challenge. And how do you do this in the RF sputtering? When you start thinking of new ways, you can make it there also. You can yes. form nanomaterials in any method. But the question is, you should be clear how you are going to control the size of the particles. That's okay, all. Thank, Once thank you can you. do that, then you can grow in any, any technique. Yeah. Sir, what is the maximum bandwidth of a semiconductor? Still, uh, if it is a exit of band gap, uh, again, we call it as insulate. Right? But what is the maximum band gap? We call it as a semiconductor. Uh, Means, yeah. uh, you, uh, you say some... 
good point yeah good point see I, 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 let me tell you there is no particular say position where you can say that it is below the semiconductor above this is insulator you cannot say this earlier yes. people thought anything which is within the band gap of our visible light which oh, okay. which means about 2.8 electron volts more than that they used to call it as an insulator but okay. now as i said gallium nitride which has a band gap of 3.4 is still called as a semiconductor okay because okay. earlier people could not make good uh, defect free materials out of them so now okay. right now even up to 4 electron volts people call it as a semiconductor okay, okay. as long okay. as you can get an excitation which goes from the electron see uh, it is about that right it's about the permittivity and the dielectric constant of that material as well as the excitation energy which is which is possible so now approximately around 4 electron volts below that you can call it as a semiconductor and above that you call it as an insulator but there is okay. no particular number to say that this is it okay yeah okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir, this is Ishwarpa from our Department of Physics. Yeah. Tell me, sir. Sir, uh, in quantum efficiency of LED, no. So defects are the main culprits. Yes. So how, how do how to reduce the defects, and what are the techniques you are using to reduce the defects? Yes. Um, so ob obviously, sir, there are uh, in the kind of molecular wave epitaxy we are doing. That's why we use MBE. Uh, because uh, it is a most beautiful controlled system you can control almost every parameter inside that growth and that is why because see there are there are two kinds of defects sir. i mean or three kinds of defects in some sense as i said one is an external defect means impurity okay let us assume we perform an experiment where no impurity comes outside from outside let us assume it is very difficult to do that experiment okay and uh, but let us assume that you can somehow manage to see that the external so that impurity that defect will not occur the second type of is a point defect okay point defect is where atoms are not sitting in their positions okay they are just displaced from their atomic positions it's called as a point defect or one atom is sitting in another another atom's position okay this is also a point defect so these are point defects and the third kind of defects is what i told you the dislocations the edge dislocation and the screw dislocations so these are the three uh, most important types of uh, uh, defects you are there so how you grow depends on uh, how you control this one is if you can use extremely pure materials if you can clean everything you you, you want every 7n pure materials then you are growing in a vacuum of 10 to the power of minus 12 tor you know those kind of things you can avoid external impurities that is that is one possibility and the other other one is the kinetics of growth see if you give enough time and energy then they will settle down in the lowest energy positions which is called as thermodynamic equilibrium so if you don't allow them to go into the thermodynamic equilibrium you can also create the defects by controlling the kinetics of growth so by changing the speed by changing the temperature also i can change the defects and control the growth so it is not necessary that uh, the material should not have defects sometimes we need defects also okay so we should be able to control the defects in these materials and that typically grows on the kinetics of growth which i would i mean uh, personally if we can discuss we can discuss a little bit more on that sir yeah can we sir uh, one more question uh, related yeah. to this yeah can, uh, can we use the some sort of a nuclear reactions uh, for doping so that it will be very clean you know uh nuclear reactions means uh, you have to i mean uh, it is possible yes i mean uh, definitely uh, nuclear reactions in these materials in this common semiconductor materials how will you do that how will you do nuclear reactions means if for what? example you know what i'm talking is a gallium nitride if you Uh, use the thermal neutrons yeah uh, thermal neutron can initiate the capture reaction uh, in uh, gallium yeah upon capturing that it uh, yeah. get like, converted into you are talking like something so like you get any like you are talking something like positron okay. positron annihilation or some program like something no, like no 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 sir no sir Neu through neutron capture reaction okay uh, i'm not when, aware of that hmm. yeah when a gallium captures neutron you know it can go yeah. into the uh, germanium Yeah. Nuclear reaction. So, yeah. mean germanium the four of an I mean tetravalent. No, but I don't want to. I don't want to change the property of my gallium, right? So why would I want to do a nuclear reaction in this? I don't. I didn't understand. Uh, but maybe yeah, I, I'll, I'll sometime talk to you separately, sir. We'll, we can have a discussion if there is some interesting way. It'll. I'll also have something to learn in that. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Okay. okay. Sir, right. I have a question, sir. Yeah. Uh, Gallium nitride is grown on silicon, silicon carbide, and uh, sapphire. Which one is better, sir? See, that's what it. See, the substrate and the material should have a, a minimum lattice mismatch, right? So now, now the, for example, silicon, the lattice mismatch is very large. It is, uh, it is order of 
23-28% lattice mismatch. Okay. In case of Sapphire, it is about 12-13% uh, lattice mismatch. Okay. And in case of uh, silicon carbide is the minimum, only 3% lattice mismatch. So it is good to grow on Sapphire. But you should also look at the other properties you require on the substrate. Because if you want light to travel, silicon carbide light doesn't travel inside that. Right? So you need all the properties. And sometimes the material, substrate material, lattice mismatch will be there, but it may not stand at large temperatures which are required to form gallium nitride. So like that, you have to look at what property you are using the material, and then you have to decide what is substrate. The most popular for LED applications is sapphire. You cannot use it on, on silicon carbide. But if you want to look at electrical properties of gallium nitride, then it's good to grow on silicon carbide, which also has a very large band gap of six electron volts and a, la and a very small lattice mismatch. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, sir. Okay, right. Okay, I have another meeting at 1.30. So if uh, if there are yes, any questions, I, okay, I just want to type my email ID in the chat box. So if somebody is interested, please write email uh, to me. Okay, I'll, I'll type uh, chatting, uh, I mean, typing it in my chat box. Thank you, sir. Now it's time to thank everyone who have directly and indirectly contributed to the webinar. I request Dr. Ashwaji Jays to propose vote of thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Ashwaji, Assistant Professor, Department of Physics, Davangere University. So I am here to present the vote of thanks for today's webinar. So the ubiquitous uh, the gallium nitride nan nanostructures. So I would like to thank our today's resource person, Professor S M Shiva Shiva Prasad sir. A director, Karnataka State Higher Education Academy, Dharwad, for enlightening us with their knowledge. So today's webinar was full of knowledge and interesting things. So it gives a deep insights into the topic and also revealed uh, some interesting facts. So the sir told us about the optoelectronics, so the importance of LEDs with the different colors of the LEDs. And sir also told us about the fiber optics and uh, the wavelength which are going to be used in the fiber optics, which is about uh, 1,553 nanometers, so which is really very important to know about this. And sir also explained uh, the difference between the conductor, semiconductor, and the insulator in a very simpler way uh, by taking an example of road and houses. So it is quite interesting thing, sir. So including me. And everyone is uh, not that much of understand the fundamentals of these things, uh, the differences between the conductor, semiconductor, and the insulators. Uh, not much as simpler as you explained in today's webinar. And uh, he also gives uh, the hint to upcoming researchers uh, to make a many number of uh, semiconductor materials. So who were willing to work in the semiconductor topic? And uh, sir, uh, he's also explained about the, the confinement of an electron as well as uh, the controlling of the defects in the solids and also the light extractions uh, to enhancing the property of the LEDs is much more important. So I'm pretty sure the precious knowledge that sir gives us very, uh, will definitely help us in our studies and future, sir. And once again, I want to thank Professor SM Shiv Prasad for taking out time for their busy schedule and enlightening us with their knowledge. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So thank you, sir. I would also thank to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor S.P. Halse, sir, Registrar, Dr. Gayatri Devaraja, madam, and Dean Faculty of Science, Professor V. Kumar, for giving permission to organizing this webinar and inviting Professor uh, SM Shiv Prasad sir to conduct it. So I want to thank the convener, Dr. M. N. Kalsat, sir, and coordinate coordinators, Ms. Shashikala, madam, and Dr. Amit, and also thank all the participants, especially the student community, who really worked hard for making this event successful. So with this, I would end my vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Thank you.